Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to Faith Foundations right here at Eagle Mountain International Church. I'm Greg Stevens. I'm an associate pastor filling in for Pastor Terry Copeland Pearsons this morning. And it is good to be back in Texas out of uh, Washington, D.C. It was gone last week. And listen, I want to thank so many of you. I was telling the crowd in here before we came on the air, I met so many partners and e-members that join you guys every single Sunday morning for Faith Foundations. Isn't that neat? You have a whole family out there around the world that's, that's with you this morning. So welcome to Eagle Mountain this morning. You ready to get into God's Word? Yes. Here we go, Father. We thank you. We praise you. We lift you up. We give you glory forever and ever. For you are the great I am that I am. We praise you. We magnify you. Father, there's not words in our language to express how we feel about you, sir. We so appreciate your anointing and your presence. Thank you for the Holy Ghost. Jesus, he's everything you promised and so much more. We ask him today to reveal things from the word to us. In the mighty name of Jesus, I come against every distraction that would distract and try to steal the word after it's sown. Give us ears to hear and hearts to receive, and we'll never, ever be the same in Jesus' name. And everybody says amen, amen and amen. All right, I am picking up, and we're going to finish off, because we started off talking about the book of 1 John. I was flying in formation with Brother Copeland and Pastor uh, George talking about the love of God. And this is really a book about being real, the reality of who we are. So I'm actually going to get to finish chapter 5. Last time I was in here, we got partway through it. We talked about the three witnesses that witness that we're saved, that we're born again, that we're in the family of God. So this is the back half of chapter 5. And we're going to look at something that sounds a little strange and controversial called the sin unto death. Ooh, that sounds scary, doesn't it? The sin unto death. Let's begin, um, where are we starting? Verse, what is this, 14? This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So if we know that he hears whatever we ask, we know that we have whatever we ask of him. Isn't that good? This is the confidence we have. Let's go on. If anyone sees his brother commit a sin, here it goes, which does not lead to death, he shall ask and he shall give him life. This is for those whose sin does not lead to death. There is, a, there is a sin that leads to death. I do not say that he should pray for it. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is a sin that does not lead to death. We know that whoever is born of God does not keep on sinning, but whoever has been born of God guards himself and the wicked one cannot touch him. Say that with me. The wicked one cannot touch him. That's the place I want to be right there, right? We know that we are of God and the whole world lies in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God has come and given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, his Son, Jesus Christ. He is true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. So be it. Okay? There is a confidence. That's how we begin 1 John chapter 5, the last part of it. There is a confidence. The Holy Spirit of God, the Lord God, wants us to be confident in our relationship, confident in our ability to go to him and ask things of him. All right. You see this concept in chapter three of first John. It's being persuaded in your soul, which is your mind, will, and emotions, or let me say your heart or your human spirit. As you grow in the word, you become persuaded and confident towards God. Convictions, we talked about this, come by human teaching. Convictions come by teaching. You are convicted a lot of times by your parents, what they taught you. you you're convicted by what uh, preachers have taught you. And so that's why we must teach the word, not traditions and religions of men. Charles Capp said it this way, the word is so simple, you need help to mess it up. <laughs> All right? I, I, I heard somebody else say it like this, and I, I like this. There are too many people will, that will not allow the word to get in the way of their theology. That's the truth. I've met them. You, you give them the word and they say, well, this is what we've been, this is what, and sir, what you're t telling me is not in the word. And so there are some people that won't allow theology, their theology to be overcome by the word of God. Now, I don't want to be that person. All right. I remember Brother Hagin saying, as soon as you start to get people free by the word, someone will pop up saying, well, you're giving somebody a license to sin. 
And then he would say, people don't need a license. All right? What we need to do, my friend, is teach the word. Teach the word. The word is the standard. It's not a dress code. Come on now. It's not denominations by men ideas. It's the word in our dispensation. You hear what I just said to you? It's the word in our time frame. Because part of this wasn't written to you and I. It was written as examples for you and I, but it's not speaking directly to us. Come on. Did I tilt you right there? So the word in our dispensation or in our time frame. Verse 14, his word is his will. The confidence is in knowing his word. I remember if you would ask Brother Hagin a question, and I did it many times, he would say, well, what does the word say about it? And I'm thinking, you're just doing that to not answer me. <laughs> no, he knew I was being lazy and wouldn't go look it up. I just wanted the answer. He wanted me to be a student of the word, and it, I believe it worked. Yes. This is the confidence. It's knowing his word. Now, in the remaining passage, he's going to hit prayer as well. I truly believe the greatest prayer ever prayed in the scripture. Who do you think, what do you think the greatest prayer was? For me, I know what it was. For, to me, the greatest prayer that was ever prayed is when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. I truly believe that was the greatest one. What did he do? He says, Abba, I know you hear me. That's confidence. That's what we're talking about, First John, right there. That's confidence. Abba, I know you hear me. And then all he said was, come forth. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, you talk about power. That was power. It wasn't a long pleading session. Come on. It wasn't saying stuff over and over and over. See, prayer, let me help you with prayer. Prayer is not about me. It's who you're praying to. It's all about who I'm praying to, not about what I'm doing. When I make prayer about what I'm doing, I just got into works. Come on now. Don't let the word get in the way of your theology. No, you let, let the word get in the way of your theology. It's like if we could get, it's like the father sets up there and says, if they could get a million people, I'm going to do something. Watch this. Are you kidding me? I think that's insulting. God is wanting to do things in the earth many times, most of the time, more than we want it done. He wants revival more than we do. Come on. So it's not about me. It's who I'm praying to. Elijah prayed one time. Prophets of Baal went all day, didn't they? But he only did one time. Guys, here's the secret to it. It's confidence, not drama. Faith, not works. Okay, I, I better get off of that, hadn't I? Uh, I'll step on the third rail. Seems to me like if you, st if, you, if you touch prayer, you can get in trouble quick. So let's get back to this thing. So if we know that he hears whatever we ask, we know that we have whatever we ask of him. Confidence, not drama. Psalm 145 backs this up. The Lord is near to all those who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. What's truth, guys? What's truth? Here's truth. So I call upon him based upon the word, right? He will fulfill the desires of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry and will save them. He desires us to have confidence. It's not a matter of the Lord notices something we say in prayer. It's not like he's up there next to, to Jesus and, and he hears something that, that Mr. D.A. says and he goes, Whoa, did you guys hear what he just said in prayer? That almost persuaded me to do something for him. Are you kidding me? He is so apt to do things for us, right? We don't have to have some flowery phrase, all right? As a matter of fact, I'm almost moved, sir, by that. If he'd, if he'd come up with another word like that, I'd, I'd do it for him. No, God's always willing to do things. It's not like he even says, how long have they been doing this? Well, I'll tell you what, if they make it another 15 minutes, I'll make it happen for them. That's not the way the Father works, guys. Brother Copeland said something in Toronto that went off in me like a bomb. How many of you watched the Toronto meetings? He said something in Toronto. Oh, my. I yelled out loud in the living room. Wrote it down on my paper. I'm telling Michelle, I said, did you hear that? He said this. You've not prayed until you've listened. 
Woo! Did you catch that? Did it go off in anybody else in this room? Man, that thing went off in me when he said that. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 19 says this. Therefore, brothers, we have, here's the word again, confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way that he's opened for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh. And since we have a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse them from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. We have confidence to enter how? By the blood. See, he opened the veil. I don't pry this thing open. I don't have to pry anything open. He opened it. I just have to have the confidence to walk in. Come on. I draw near with full assurance with our bodies washed with pure water. We talked about that in, first, in, in chapter 1 of First John, where he says, you've already been cleansed. You don't need to be washed again, just your feet. Remember that? Got into all of that. Remember, we covered all of that. So you don't need to be washed again. I'm already clean. We go on from praying for ourselves to praying for others. Now, people mix this. Let's get into this sin and a death thing. You ready? People mix this thing up with the unpardonable sin. They are not the same thing. Did anybody growing up in the church ever feel like they committed the unpardonable sin? Okay, a hand in the sound booth and me. I always was afraid of that because I'd been taught it all my life. What you teach will build up and become a conviction to you. So I always thought I had committed the unpardonable sin. Listen, if you think you've committed it and you're in this church, you haven't. Let's go on verse 16 to 17. If anyone sees his brother commit a sin, which it does not lead to death, he shall ask and he shall give him life. I don't have time to go into this, but I could show you something in the words of Jesus right there. This is for those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I do not say that we should pray for it. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is a sin that does not lead to death. Seize his brother. Guys, we're talking about believers here. Okay. Now I'm going to make a statement and then we're going to look up some examples to back it up. All right. So. Seat belts on, floaties pumped up. I'm going to say something. I do not want to tip over any sacred cows in the room. So I warned you, right? I warned you. The unbeliever does the unpardonable sin. The believer commit, can commit the sin unto death. The sin unto death is not sin or a particular action. Unpardonable is only one. There's only one unpardonable. Okay, we're going to get into it. So the sin unto death is done over and over. You'll not take correction. You'll not correct yourself. You'll not judge yourself. And what it does is it begins to affect those believers around you in a negative way. All right. You've sown so much negatively to the flesh so often that you reap in the, you reap in your flesh death. What happens is your protection is gone. Matter of fact, Brother Copeland talked about this and he talked about a threefold uh, curse. Let's go ahead and watch that and I'll come right back. We had a technical difficulty on that. You guys let me know when you, when you get that. We'll come back to it. Everybody wants to see that, right? Yeah. Well, I'll keep going until we find that out. Now, when the unpardonable sin is first mentioned by Jesus, it's in context of encounters with the Frankensteins. You know who the Frankensteins are? The Pharisees. So the Pharisees have it. You got it? Ready? Here, let's watch that, Brother Copeland. In the Bible, when the Bible refers to death, it's not the dictionary definition of death or the cessation of life. Where the human being is concerned, there is no such thing. Even though your body dies, 
It's coming back. Are you listening? It's coming back. And I don't care whether you're born again or not. You don't become a, 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 a son or a daughter of God after you die. If you're not already a son or a daughter, when you die, you ain't going. You're going, but it's not going to be at the right hand of the Father. Amen. Amen. So if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, then you still belong to the devil. Hell was made for the devil and his angels, not for men. God has never sent any man or woman to hell. Never. Never. He, that's not his job. That's not what he does. But you're going to be present with your Lord. Whoever that may be. Well, I know who my Lord is. It's Jesus. And because I know that, I know spiritually where I'm headed. Come on now. Let's go on to this. Let's, let's look at this thing. So they, they talk about Jesus, the Pharisees do. And he cast out a devil and they begin to mock him. And they say that he does this by the power of Satan. Now, Satan will always do that. He calls light dark and dark light good, evil, and evil good. That's the way he operates, all right? Jesus said all manner of blasphemy and sin can be forgiven except lying to the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 12, verse 31 and 32. Matthew 12, 31 and 32. I'll read it for you. Therefore, I say to you, all kinds of sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven men. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. You can say whatever you want to about Jesus, you can be forgiven of it, right? But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, neither in this world nor in the world to come. Now, the only sin that the Holy... We've talked about this when we talked in, first cha in chapter 1 and in chapter 2. The only sin the Holy Spirit convicts of is the rejection of Jesus as Lord. Right? We studied that in this series. John 16, verse 8, Jesus is saying here, when he comes, talking of the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of sin, singular, and of righteousness and judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. So the unpardonable sin is rejecting Jesus. And rejecting the conviction of the Holy Spirit concerning who Jesus is. That's the only one. That's the only sin that will keep you from heaven. We just heard Brother Copeland talk about that. The rejection of his atonement. That, let me help you with what your part of salvation is. That's the only part of salvation I have something to do with. By accepting him, listen to me. Oh, I'm about to set somebody free. By accepting him, you canceled the unpardonable sin in your life. Yeah. Woo, glory to God. Now, I don't have to deal with that ever again. I said, I don't have to deal. I'm about to get happy. I don't have to deal with that ever again. I don't know how you can sit there. I'm, I'm telling you what. Woo, glory to God. The Holy Spirit convicts the world of the ministry and work of Jesus. And as we preach Jesus with our words and with our lives, they will have to accept or reject Jesus. And that is acceptance of the Holy Spirit or blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. All right? I hope that helps somebody. I spent most of my youth fearing this. So I wouldn't go to movies because the rapture might happen while I was in the movie. We wouldn't eat at a restaurant that had pool tables that you put money in. Somehow pool tables that you didn't put money in are different than pool tables that you put money in because the pastor had a pool table, but you didn't put money in it. You could play cards, but they couldn't be like casino cards. They could be rook cards because rook was the official card game of our denomination. Isn't it silly? But, but as I became older and all of a sudden I'm around believer friends and they're playing with cards and I'm like, oh, this, this, I'm convicted. Is that conviction based upon this? No. But it's just as real. Come on, right? It's legalism. So, 
Let me get back to the sin unto death. It's not one particular thing. It's something or several somethings that cause others to stumble. Now you got to understand what Brother Copeland just said. God's not killing you. It's a sin that gets you away from his protection. That's eventually going to lead to a physical death. And uh, I'm going to show you some examples, but let me, uh, let me play this clip from Brother Copeland here about the, about the permissive part. Watch this. The word to put on is mistranslated in Hebrew. He'll put these diseases on your other diseases he put on Egypt. That at the time the translators translated that, Hebrew was a, not a spoken language, it's a dead language. And there's Gentiles to start with. I'm talking about the King James translations and others that were translated off the King James. And it was translated in a causative verb, not understanding there was a permissive verb in Hebrew, which the Israelis use it correctly today in, in common speech. And it just simply meant to permit. He didn't put it. He permitted it to be put. He couldn't do anything else. He'd given his word. I will protect you if you'll stay with me. But if you disobey me, you're out of my jurisdiction. And the curses will come on you. Now that's correctly translated. They will come. They're there. It, the devil just waiting on you. It'll still work the same way today. You get out of the New Testament law of love. And he's just waiting on you. He's waiting on you. You get out of the law of love and you step out there in his territory and bam, oh, I mean, sickness, disease, poverty, debt, all that stuff is just hanging there. But we don't have to get into that. Amen. We're supposed to be walking by faith, which works by love. We walk by faith, which works by love. That's what this whole chapter is about, guys. Us as believers walking in love. I said this last time that if we, we focus so much on faith and I'm not, that's not bad. I'm not saying we did anything wrong, but if you would grow your love, faith and, and love grow together. And if you'll grow in love, faith will grow. Missed a great opportunity right there. So what we're doing today is destroying fear with knowledge. Hebrews chapter 12, I'm going to go to verse 9. Hebrews chapter 12 speaks to us about discipline from a heavenly father. That's not hard or harsh, and it's so that we may live. Let me read it to you. Hebrews 12, 9. I'm in the modern English version, for those of you online that want to know. Furthermore, we have had human fathers, and they corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? How much more should we reverence our Heavenly Father, right? So, the sin unto death results, now listen to this, in, earthly, in our earthly life. We lose our earthly life. It results in the loss of rewards in heaven. Do you remember we talked about wood, hay, and stubble, silver, gold, precious stones? It results in the loss of that. It does not result in the loss of your salvation. I'm going to prove it to you. Did you hear what I just said? Did I tilt anybody? I heard a cow tip back there. <laughs> I thought I heard a sacred cow fall. It results in the loss of your earthly life, your physical life. It results in the loss of rewards in heaven. It, it, you lose a lot of your testimony, but you do not lose your salvation. I'll show it to you. Um, and I find something else interesting. I always see it in the word. It happens in the word. In the examples given in the word, it's always somebody that seems to be involved in leadership because they're leading other people astray. Let me show you. Psalm 118. Psalm 118, David mentions it. He writes, I shall not die, but I shall live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has severely chastened me. But he's not, look at this, but he has not given me over unto death. Hear it? 
open to me this gates of righteousness and I will go into them. Didn't we talk about confidence going into the veil in Hebrews a while ago? And I will praise the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through. I will thank you that you have heard me. There it is again. Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I'm talking about confidence here. David's got a confidence. This, this is written. This is after Bathsheba. Let's go on. I thank you that you have heard me and you've become my deliverance. Notice he has not given me over unto death. And I thank you that you've heard me. When David repents to the prophet as he was being confronted, the, the, the prophet came to him and gave him an example of a man. And he said, well, that man should surely die. And the prophet points his finger and says, it's you. Remember that? David said this, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan immediately tells him, and you will not die. I believe had David lied to himself in 1 John chapter 1, we talk about lying, deceiving yourself. If he would have lied to himself and tried to lie to the prophet, I believe he would have died. I think he would have been turned over because the prophet said right here, you won't die. I'll show you some other examples. David had witnessed, see, David had witnessed this whole thing play out with King Saul, hadn't he? Let me show you an example. First Chronicles, First Chronicles chapter 10, verse 13 and 14. First Chronicles chapter 10, verse 13 and 14. We know what Saul does. He goes to a, a, a seer, a medium, a witch to, to contact the prophet because the prophet has already died. Look at this. So Saul died because of his unfaithful deeds against the Lord because of his failure to keep the word of the Lord and because he sought to consult a spirit of divination, but did not seek the Lord. So he killed him and turned the kingdom over to David, <clears throat> the son of Jesse. So here's the interesting thing. I've had people, I've heard people teach that, that uh, Saul was a big failure. And I played the fool and he's in hell. I don't think he's in hell. I don't think so at all. Why? Because in first Samuel 28, in that seance or whatever it was, where he sees the prophet, um, Samuel says, Samuel is in paradise, and Samuel says to the king, um, he rebukes him, and he goes, tomorrow you will be here. So Saul ends up in paradise, but his flesh dies. His, his influence dies. He loses his kingship. He loses his entire family. Come on now. Is this, is this getting clearer for people now? You starting to see this thing? So it cost him his kingdom. It cost him his life. It cost him the life of his sons. But it did not cost him posi his position with the Lord. I love that. He refused to lead the nation of God and the people of God correctly. So that takes me up to Acts chapter 5. What happens in Acts chapter 5? There's two people, Ananias and Sapphira. Remember them? Some people say they weren't believers. Other people say they were believers. I really truly believe, it doesn't matter either way for me, but I truly believe they were influential people in the congregation in Jerusalem at that time, and they were turned over immediately to the destruction of their flesh. Okay? Because I truly believe, knowing the character and nature of the Father, I believe he gave them many, many opportunities to turn around. That's just his character. That's just his nature. Come on, hadn't he done that with us? Yes. <clears throat> all right, let me help you with something. We've all lied to the Holy Spirit. How many of you have lied to the Holy Spirit? I have. There's a few hands that didn't go up. Reach your hands out toward that section right there. <laughs> we all have. We all have. Well, I haven't. Really? You just did. He <laughs> Man, I'm winning friends in this room today. Colonel, you got me on this? Okay. Here's the deal. The Holy Spirit impresses upon you to bless somebody, and you say, yes, sir, I'll do it, and then you don't. He, he, the Holy Spirit impresses on you um, to get up today and actually get to church. And you say, and you say, you say I will, and then you don't. Well, what do you call that? Seriously, what, what would you call that? You tell your, okay, as a parent, 
Jesus said, you being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your heavenly father. As a parent, you tell your son, I want you to take the trash out of the can and take it out and put it in the trash can out there and put another bag inside. They take the trash out, they set it by the door. Ask me how I know this. <laughs> they set it by the door and you say, didn't I ask you to take, I did take the trash out. You took it out of there, but you set it right there. I did it, dad, I did it. Is that a lie? Half a lie? Oh, now we're grading on the curve. Now we, why weren't you my mom? <laughs> but see, that's what we do with the heavenly father, isn't it? I want you to bless that person. Yes, sir. And then you don't. It has to be a lie when you said you would. So how many of us have lied to the Holy Spirit? There are still a few stubborn ones in this room. Would you check their pulse, please? Reset your neighbor over there. Of course we have. We've all done it. How about the sound booth? How about you guys? Yeah, all right. We've all done it. And we didn't die, which tells me that's not, we're not talking about the same things here, are we? All right. In 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 10, I won't go into all of it, but there's a lot of things and a lot of people want to kick people out of the church all the time based upon um, that chapter. Um, in, in the time that I was a senior pastor, there was only two times I ever asked somebody not to come back to our church. I gave them the right foot of fellowship, only twice, and they were both extreme conditions, okay? Um, there's a man that is in the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He's committing adultery with his stepmother. Oh, right? Oh, I just went California on you. I just, I just, uh, I just did what my daughter, who was raised in Southern California, oh, you know, <laughs> as if, whatever. <laughs> now, Paul didn't have a word of knowledge about this. He, he writes, it's commonly reported. Everybody knew it, which tells me that the apostle John would have known it because he's in Ephesus, right? Everyone knew it without Facebook, without Twitter, without fake news. They knew it, right? So Paul quits praying for him. Listen to this. Paul quits praying for him and turns him over for the destruction of his flesh. And I'll read it to you in verse five. It says, deliver him to Satan <clears throat> for the destruction of of his flesh so that the spirit may be saved on the day of our Lord Jesus. See that? We're only dealing with the flesh here, not the spirit man. All right. What it, what it, eventually, here's what happens. The man repents. Paul has to write the church. They were excited to kick him out. Come on. He had to write him back and say, bring him back. He repented. He's okay. They were less, less quick to bring him back and to restore him. That's why James writes, you which are spiritual, restore. Oh, goodness. Goodness. We need to act like daddy. It seems to me, though, as I look at this, that Satan could do nothing to him while he was in the church. He had to be turned over. Oh, you didn't hear what I just said to you. It seems to me, though, that Satan couldn't do anything to him in the church. Why? Jesus is the head of the church. We're the body. We are single members, fitly joined. Satan can't be in the body. He can attend our church. He can't be in it. See, once I'm born again, I am a member of the body. He's the head. Can Satan be in the head of the church? No. Therefore, he can't be in the members. That'll set you free. I'm telling you what, I'm about to have another spell again. I don't know how you guys can sit there. 
That man turns, he repents. It seems, though, that Satan could do nothing while he was in the church. This is why Jesus said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. It's important you go to church. This is where we're built up. This is where the nets are mended for you to go back out into the harvest. The harvest happens with you. Goodness. So Paul puts him back in the church. And they weren't eager to do that. Let me show you another example of this. Because on the mouth of two or three witnesses, right? I've already given you two or three. Here's another one. King Hezekiah. Remember him? Well, not personally. But he did the same thing. God had told Israel never go back to Egypt for help. And Hezekiah does. And he begins to get sick. And the prophet Isaiah goes to him and said to him, get your house in order. Remember that? And the king turns his face to the wall and repents. And the prophet had already left and he turns around because God tells him, tell him I'm going to give him 15 more years because he repented. That's the heart of the father. We always want to run everybody out of here that doesn't talk like us, walk like us, think like us. No, you need to get the heart of the father on things. That'll come through leadership. Okay? He said, never go back to Egypt. He does it. He repents. The prophet tells him, you give you 15 more, year, 15 more years. Much of the body of Christ is in this condition today. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord unworthingly will be guilty of the blood and body of the Lord. And that's what we do. Not that you're unworthy. You're treating the body and the blood unworthy. We talked about that last time in 1 John, about the blood. And we plead the blood on every single thing. And I told you the story about what the Lord spoke to me concerning a car. Do you remember that? I was pleading the blood on this hoopy old car that I didn't take care of. And the blood, I'm going to say this one more time, is the most precious, most priceless commodity in the known universe. And for me, I have to be very careful about what I sling it on. Okay, I'm going. Don't get under conviction. Go to the word. 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 The result of this is found in verse 30 of 1 Corinthians 11. For this reason, many are weak and unhealthy among you, and many die. Weak, unhealthy, and eventually die. All right? We compete against other parts of the body rather than be in unity. See, we're, we're part of the body. So is the church down the hill. So is the one across town. I am a branch office. My bank account is at Wells Fargo. If I go to the Wells Fargo bank, I'm trying to learn where everything is. Alliance, there's one in Alliance, right? If I go to the one in Alliance, that's where I open the account. And then I, there's one out here in Newark. And if I go to that one, the one in Alliance doesn't call me up and say, did we do something to offend you? Because we noticed you went to that one. Come on, they're just a branch office. They don't care. And that's the way we need to be in the body of Christ. I don't care. We're a branch office. All right. So we, we ought to stop competing. We are in strife with our brothers, not in love. We talk against their church. And we're all healed by the stripes of the blood, right? The, uh, the blood on his back. We're healed and we go. Here's another thing that we do. We're healed. How many of you have been healed? Praise God for that. Almost every hand. Are we rightly dividing the body and the blood if we've been healed and go right back to eating all kind of junk? Oh, see, now, now I messed up, didn't I? We go right back to not taking care of ourselves, expecting God to just bail us out next time. Oh, my. All right. Well, here's the deal. You're not honoring the body. You're hurting the other church and you're hurting the head of the church. That's who you're speaking against. When you speak against another believer, you're speaking against the head of the church. All right, here's another example of this. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. 1 Timothy 1, 19 and 20. Keeping faith and good conscience, which, have, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Among these, and he names two guys, whom I have delivered to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. He delivered them over. Now, I think that the scripture, I've given you enough that we're proving the point. Back to 1 John chapter 5. There comes a point when we don't pray for a person. You find it in Romans 16 and over in 1 Thessalonians. 
We don't quit loving them. We just don't know how to pray for them anymore. And so here's how you pray. When you don't know how to do that, having confidence, come on, we pray the Ephesian prayers. Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 3, Paul's prayers in Colossians. You start to pray that the eyes of their understanding be enlightened by the word that they may see and know. Come on, right? You, that you're praying for a believer in that thing. That they be rooted and grounded in love and to know the love. Come on, right? We, that's when now you're interceding over a believer that you may not be in strong fellowship with anymore. Come on now. But in order to not create, create and gender more strife, I just pray those prayers. And there's you a good place to plead the blood. Come on now. There's a good place to plead the blood over another believer. Right? Your prayer becomes a sanctifying effect. I said, as long as he was in that church, it seems like Satan couldn't do anything to him. In Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, it talks about bearing one another's burdens. Brothers, if a man is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, watching yourselves, lest you should be tempted, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? Love. And faith works how? Love. For if someone thinks himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own burden. Let him who is taught the word share all good things with him who teaches. We help a brother until they reach a place they can bear it themselves. Matthew 7 speaks of this same principle. He says, if a brother has a splinter in his eye, you don't cut his head off. Right? 1 John chapter 5, verse 18 and 19. Let's get back on track. We know that whoever is born of God does not keep on sinning, but whoever has been born of God guards himself, and the wicked one cannot touch him. We know that we're of God, and the whole world lies in wickedness. We know we're of God. A believer cannot produce sin from his new nature. You're a new creation that never existed before. He can, he can practice it as an outward act, but he can't create it from within. An unbeliever cannot create righteousness from within. He can only imitate righteousness. And look at that. The wicked one cannot touch him. The spirit man, that's the real you. Amen? Verse 20, we know. There it is. We know. We have full confidence and finally, we don't follow idols. Idolatry is, what is idolatry? It's anything that exalts itself above God. If fantasy football exalts itself, well, bad example. I'm in Texas. If the Dallas Cowboys exalt themselves, come on now. Whatever exalts itself above your relationship with your father, I'm just telling you, I'm not trying to condemn you or put condemnation on you. I'm trying to tell you, examine yourselves. We all have to come up to another level at this church. We are the revival capital of the world. Amen? And they're coming. I said they're coming. I met them this last week in Washington, D.C. I'm coming there, Pastor Greg. I'm coming there. These teachings, this is that happening. Watching these miracles, I'm coming there. There's a desire in people to get where the presence of God is. And you got to get yourself ready. I've got to get myself ready for that. Amen? You got you to gotta prepare yourself for the day when somebody's sitting in your favorite seat. Come on now. Well, who are they? Well, they just came here from Alaska. That's who they are. Or Hawaii or some Idaho or somewhere, North Dakota. Well, they're in my favorite seat. That's our row. Well, guess what? Guess what? Guess, guess what just happened? You're, you're fighting against the body. Ouch. Ouch. Giving you a bunch of pastoral things today. An unbeliever cannot create righteousness from within. He can only imitate righteousness. And the wicked one cannot touch him. Remember when Hammer sang that song, Can't Touch This? That's where we're at. Can't touch this. That's why I say to the devil all the time, you can't touch this. The only way you can touch this is for me to get out here. And I promise you with this, I'm not going to get out there because I've been out there before. And I don't like it out there. Right? And we don't follow idols, so we don't, we don't allow idolatry to get in us. I remember the prophet 
at Minister's Conference. The prophet, Brother Copeland, I think he was right over here, stood right over here. And by the word of the Lord, said something to leaders of churches from all over the world. And here's what he said. Get your house in order. He said that's what he heard the Lord saying. to, And he's speaking to leaders. Get your house in order. That's where it starts, guys. That's the chain of command. That's where it starts. And then that what Hezekiah, when that what was said, get your house in order. I'm telling you, it's time now for the house of God, for the leadership to get their house in order. So that the body will be healthy. We are the revival capital of the world. So I'm going to say this to you. Get your house in order. Each and every one of us begins with me, goes out from me to my family and my family to your family. Let me show you something in closing. I got just enough time. Go to first Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10. This will help you. This will help you see it. First Corinthians, that's second Corinthians should be right in front of it, shouldn't it? First Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse number one. For I want you to know brothers. So who's he writing to? The church believers. For I want you to know brothers that our fathers were all under the cloud and passed through the sea and were, listen to this, and were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Isn't that interesting phrasing? And all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. Now look at that for a second. Once I'm saved, I'm a new creation, correct? Never existed before. Satan has as much authority over me. Let me say it this way. Satan and sin are synonymous terms. Because sin comes from, right? So I, I can replace those two terms. They're synonymous. Satan or sin. Once I'm saved, I'm out of his kingdom and in the kingdom of light. He said that they, were, they went through the Red Sea and the cloud. That's how the baptism. They're, they were baptized. They were baptized in the Red Sea. That's baptism in water. They were baptized with the cloud. That's a spirit baptism. That's Holy Spirit baptism. Can you see that? I've never saw that before until just a week or so ago. Look, well, look at that. It says they were baptized in water and in the spirit. Once I'm saved, I'm a new creation. And I listen to this. Satan has as much or sin has as much authority over me as Pharaoh had over Israel after the Red Sea. How much authority did Pharaoh have over Israel? Absolutely none. He and his whole army were fish food. Right? He had absolutely no authority. Yet you see them wanting to go back. That's all in here. They had to renew their thinking. They had been baptized in water. They had been baptized in the spirit. They had been fed. They had drank from the well of Jesus. Come on. And so I'm going to tell you, we're in the same boat as they are. We got to get our thinking renewed. Amen. So you haven't committed the unpardonable sin. And none of us are going to commit the sin unto death. Is that right? We're not going to keep going and going and going and going outside of the light. I'm telling you what, I love 1 John. 1 John is serious stuff and it's about growing up in him. So I'm going to say this one more time. Satan and sin has as much authority over you as Pharaoh had over the children of Israel after the Red Sea. Once you crossed over... Once, once I became a believer, once I crossed over and became a new creation, he has no authority over me any longer. Sin has no power over me. Satan has no glory over me. None. That thing has been cut off by the blood of the lamb. Amen. Praise God. Glory to God. Let's thank you for it. Father, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' mighty, mighty name. Amen and amen and amen. All right, take a break. We'll be back in just a moment. In 2017, Kenneth Copeland Ministries will be celebrating with you 50 years of ministry. 
You have been a part of every life change, every seed sown, and every salvation of over 100 million souls. And there is no better place to celebrate than the 2017 Southwest Believers Convention. There is a mighty army in the land, saith the Lord. My army, my men and women are rising up and taking their place in the authority of my kingdom. A new breed of believer is in the land who will not accept sickness nor disease as normal, will not accept poverty and death, but rise up in it and stand over it in the name of Jesus and declare the blessing. Hallelujah. This powerful meeting will be like no other, so don't miss out. Make plans to join us as we celebrate 50 years of ministry at the 36th Annual Southwest Believers Convention. With new dates starting July 30th through August 5th. Register today at kcm.org slash SWBC17. Good morning, church family. We just received a tremendous uh, teaching on the gospel of First John. So we would like to encourage you guys, as you just finished watching or joining us for Faith Foundations, don't forget we have those archive videos on our website. We want to encourage you to go back and re-listen to those, as I know I will have to do as well. We want to welcome you this morning, Pastor Greg. Made it. Yes, thank you ran. You. Good, good running. Thank you, thank you. Great, great teaching this Thank morning. You. I, you know, um, I was so afraid growing up that I had committed the unpardonable sin, and there's no way. And it, it led me, that lie of the enemy led me down a path that was destructive. Well, we know if, it, if it's done that for you, it's doing that for many, many people, yeah. that they're still in, in a part of deception, that they, they can be free from. And that's what you preached. You preached the truth and knowledge, gave us that knowledge to know, go to the word and get set free from these things. You need to study this first John, this chapter. Yes. I, I read it every single day. I read the entire book of first John and it's becoming alive to me that, that exactly who he says I am is who I am. Well, yeah, and the, what you pointed out with love. how it's love, the love of the, how love and faith grow together. Yeah. So, so you grow in love, you grow in faith. It's not one apart from the See, other. See, I spent so much time trying to grow my faith that I, you know, I was frustrated. I was trying to always determine, do I have great faith or I have little faith? Or I have, if I just grow in love, the faith part's there because yeah. faith works by love. love. Absolutely great, great right. teaching. Absolutely um, true. You know, our mission statement here at EMIC talks a lot about discipling. And this teaching, this specific teaching and the teachings that Pastor Terry have done in the past, that is part of the process. Discipleship is an important part of our maturing process. This is how you grow. Yeah. You grow by getting in the word. You grow by, by learning it and, and letting it come out of you so that, you know, when you squeeze the, the tube of toothpaste, whatever's in there is what's going to come out. And when, when a squeeze hits yeah. you, Pressure whatever's in you is yeah. going to come out yeah. of you. So true. And so that's exactly what happens with the you and, you and I is when the squeeze hits, what's going to come out of you, either, you know, some TV analyst thoughts or, yes. you know, what the word says. Or and you got to get, you got to yeah. get to the point to where what the word says is, is more real than anything else. Yeah. It's got to be more real than any thing else in your life. And so that when, when you get the report from the doctor and they use the big C word or whatever it is, whatever word, the, the word rises up, a scripture rises up, something rises up in me. And that's how you grow. And really that's operating in faith. That's great faith because yeah. you're growing in your confidence in him. When Pastor Terry taught us about the ministry of the Holy yes. Spirit, this is all just having confidence in who he is. And not, and you're not alone. God, no, Jesus never. didn't leave us alone on the earth. I will never but, leave but you nor us. forsake you. Yes. Lo, I'm with you always, even into the end of the and age. And the, the important part that um, I, I think is also important for all of us to realize, whether you're watching online, wa watching by television or hearing us, um, you're part of the body. Mm -hmm. We're part of the body. We're working together. That's right. And I think as, as we grow in the word together, that unity of the body becomes so powerful. Well, that's what's going to bring him back. Oh, is anytime you want you want to move with the Holy Spirit in your life, you want to move with the Holy Spirit in your church, pastors, here's how you do it. 
And when they when they got in unity, suddenly would yes. always happen. Yes. Anytime people get in unity, God shows up. Well, it could be the two of us in unity over a certain thing, or it can be the whole congregation in unity. And I believe that's one of the reasons this, the preaching of the word goes first, mm -hmm. but then the signs and, and everything follow. Acts but when chapter, we're in unity as a congregation. Acts chapter 2, yes. Acts chapter 4, they got in unity, the place was shaken. Let me go all the way back to the Tower of Babel. Yeah. Heathens got in unity, and God said, let's go see this thing that they do. Because God always not shows impossible. up. He, he always shows attention. up when people are in Amen. unity. And so that's the deal. If we'll get the body of Christ unified, we won't, we, here, we won't unify over doctrine. That's right. We unify over Jesus. Over we the unify word. over, Jesus. over the spirit of faith or the unity of the faith, not over doctrine. Because you believe somebody needs to be sprinkled, so some, somebody else believes they got to be dunked. It's, it, that, who cares? What, what matters is, is that we unify over the word. And that's what's coming up next yes. week. The Southwest Believers Convention. Yay. You saw a promo about that. I am so excited. And so many of our, our uh, partners and friends are coming. It's going to be July 30th through August the 5th in Fort Worth, Texas. I'm going to tell you something. Fort Worth is never going to be the same not, not after, after this, this meeting. Yeah. I'm telling you. Shoo, mercy, get ready, get ready, get ready, because something's about to happen uh, yeah. in downtown Fort Worth, a spiritual explosion. Well, and I Fort believe Worth. everybody that's coming is already coming. They're already prepared. They're ready. They're expecting to receive. We're waiting to meet you yes. next week and the, and and the, the Sunday after week. right here. There are shuttles available. On the mountain. Go up there to the register on online and register. Let us know that you're coming. Yes. And we want to welcome you here at Eagle Mountain International Church. I do want to share one thing coming up after that, Friday's September the 29th and September the 30th. There's a special men's conference right here at EMIC. Watch this and then we'll come back and pray with you before we go into the live service. Men, listen up because you won't want to miss this. Built to last. Men's conference at Eagle Mountain International Church Friday and Saturday, September 29th and 30th. Including an amazing time of worship by Michael Howell. Great food at the after party and Saturday morning breakfast. VIP meet and greet, and a powerful message from keynote speaker, Mark Barclay. It's time to cash in our meow. Our quimpy little, I don't know, I'm going to make it or not. You know, meow. It's time to cash that in for the lion's roar. The roar of the lion of the tribe of Judah. It's called a war cry. Make plans now and invite your friends, your fathers, your brothers and sons to Built to Last 2017 Men's Conference here at EMIC, Friday and Saturday, September 29th and 30th. Register now at EMIC.org. Built to Last, the Men's Conference in September. Praise God. You don't want to miss that. Um, Dr. Dr. Barkley, he used to come to our church when we pastored in California. He is he used to be a Marine Corps drill sergeant. And can he can he can hit the word boy? That, that drill sergeant, yeah. that drill sergeant will come out at him. And it's going to be a wonderful time. Yes. For, there's nothing wimpy. No. About Doc Barkley. No, there not is not at all. He's got a boldness. He's the, called the preacher of righteousness. So go ahead, man, and get yourself ready. Come out here uh, to Eagle Mountain on the September 29th Amen. and 30th. Plus, there's going to be some other special things that yeah, we always. didn't we didn't announce always in that. So cool make stuff. sure make sure you come to to build the last next week. Southwest Believers yes. Convention, and then Men's Conference is coming after that. All right, before we go into our live service, let's, Michelle and I, pray for yes. you. Father, in the name of Jesus, you, we Father. pray for our partners. I thank you yes, for them. Lord. I pray peace on yes. their lives right now. I pray healing on their bodies. Hearts, I pray that their minds are receive. alert and they're yes. ready to receive what's yes. about to happen to in hear. this church in service. Jesus. And we praise you for them in yes. Jesus' mighty and holy, 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 holy name. name. Amen and amen and amen. Okay, here we go. Here Pastor we go. George is here. Updates about Kufi and what happened there. And Exciting. so much more. You're not going to well miss this. Remember that we love you. Yes. God loves you. And what? Jesus, Jesus is Lord. Lord. You're watching the Believer's Voice of Victory Network. Real life faith. The healing power is beginning to work. It's beginning to work in you. It's beginning to work on you. Those of you who have come today to have hands laid upon you, come, make a line right here. Make a line right here, and I want my healing team to come out. Healing team, come on out. 
Oh God, I thank you. I thank you for signs and wonders and miracles that are taking place here. And as those that are coming to the altar are coming up here right now, I pray the prayer of faith over you. You take your hand and you put it in your heart. And you receive. You receive everything that God has for you today. If you have believed and received, then we are setting ourselves in agreement. We set ourselves in agreement right now with those who have already de determined to believe your word and receive. And I declare that we are in agreement with you for your healing, for your miracle. It's working. It's working on the inside of you right now. It's working on the inside of you right now. My neck, it's been, I've had an issue in my neck for about the last four months. And when you called that out about necks, I mean, it's been every day and, and my neck is totally free. We've been confessing about, you know, new and better job. Yeah. God has given me a better job, better commute, increase Woo! everything. So glory to God. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. I have two of them. Uh, ears they pop. Ears pop. Ears pop. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wow. <laughs> and on my foot. What happened uh, to your foot? But uh, arch, arch yeah. of foot. Yeah. It's been real sore, tight, oh, a lot of pain. It's gone. <laughs> oh, give God glory. Hi there. So we're new here, and um, this is my daughter, Maria, and she arrived 10 days ago covered in rashes. Oh. And today, she flipped over at me, and there's... Look at that. Caleb, can you see her? Oh. No, no rash. Wow. No rashes. No oh. rashes. Praise <laughs> God. I hadn't been able to hear a message in over a year without a listening device. Yes, oh. And I picked up Spanish by mistake this morning. <laughs> <laughs> so I unplugged it, then I realized I didn't need it. I heard every word that you said.
of grace itself is that it's given. The nature of God himself is that grace is given. But now old Robert said something. He said miracles are either coming to you or they're going past you. So what is the difference in what you reach out with by faith and you take it? When faith takes it, faith says, I have that. Faith knows I have that. Faith, faith isn't just putting up a fight to get it. God has given it and faith just receives it. That grace is just flowing towards you. It's flowing towards you. It's coming towards you. It's coming up in you. It's coming on you. And the grace of God is his ability, his power to be everything he wants you to be, to do everything he wants you to do, and to have everything he wants you to have. And thank you, Lord, that by that grace we just... And so I like when I'm singing that song sometimes. I like that song. I learned it just as a little girl in Sunday school. And that song, And I, but I've learned to sing it, Oh, by grace, oh, by faith, I trust him more. By faith, I take that grace. Oh, by, by the faith and grace of God, I do trust him more. I trust him. And he's so good, he, he, by his grace, he gives us the faith to believe for more grace. He's just so good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Patrick, would you come stand up here by me? And let's just sing through that. Jesus, Jesus. But let's sing it sweet. It's a sweet song to sing. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust you, how I proved you, Lord, and Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, by faith, I trust you. I trust. 
you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So now, Lord, as we pray over this service this morning, we thank you, Lord, that we'll continue from this moment going forward, that by the grace of God, this service will be everything you want it to be. And in this service, you will do everything you want to do. And in this service, Lord, we will have from you everything you want us to have. We thank you, Lord, and we receive it in the name of Jesus. Do you agree? Amen. Amen. Well, love on somebody as you go back to your seat. Praise God. the Lord. It's so good to see you this morning. Good to have you in the house of God. Good to be the house of God. Good to come to a place where love is king and Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah. So glad that we can come together and just start off praising God with a with that strong note of victory in our hearts and in our mouths. Well, I welcome you. How many of you, it's your very first time here at the mountain? First timers, could I see your hand, please? We just want to, whoa, there's a group all the way to the back. Give them a big hand. We're so glad you came. We're here, some over here. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for bringing them here. Listen, there's a card under the seat in front of you, and if you'll fill that out, we would appreciate it because it gives us an opportunity for two things. One, that we can have a record of your visit to pray over you, but it also gives us a chance to sow some seed. What do I mean by that? To give you something and to be a blessing. We love to give. So if you'll fill that card out and at the end of the service, take it to the hospitality room, which is to my right and your left, then we have a gift for you. What a wonderful, man, that's great to come to church and they give you something before you leave. But you're going to get a lot of things before you leave here today. Now, if you'll look under the seat in front of you, that card's there. If there's not one for some reason, or if you're on the front row, just raise your hand again and our ushers will jump up and be glad to give you a card and respond. Anybody that doesn't have a card, just raise your hand. And those of you that are watching online, you could be at the top of the world. Did you know we have folks that watch us from just as far to the top as you can, can get? It's amazing. There are folks up there that watch with generators and tents. They like living out on the ice and the cold. You need to come to Texas, let me tell you. But we thank God there are people watching from the top of the world to the bottom and all the way around the middle. Praise God. So we're thankful for you and we welcome you into this service today. And I say that on purpose, not that you are just observing, that you're not just watching TV, but that we welcome you into this service. You know, the apostle Paul said, I I beheld your service and he wasn't even there, but by the Holy Spirit, he was able to know what was going on and he didn't have an iPhone, but he had something better than an iPhone. He had the Holy Spirit. So we're all together by the Spirit of God. So we welcome you this morning. Praise God. Well, I have several things. First of all, I want to say thank you to everyone who turned out Wednesday night. Did we have some fun or what here on the mountain? So we're glad every one of you that will come here on the mountain. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thanks, Colin. And the fireworks, I'm t- you know, when they first said, we're going to have fireworks, you know, the first thought that crosses your mind, church fireworks, where we're going to hand out sparklers and all the kids were going to run around in circles and uh, maybe throw firecrackers or something. But it wasn't firecrackers. It was fireworks. I'm telling you, it was amazing. And I can say I, I like fireworks. I've seen some of the best in the world, but I've never seen them anointed before. <laughs> and we had those fireworks, and I watched those, and I thought, I needed that. It was so wonderful. So all of you that came, God bless you. And all of you that didn't come, <laughs> they'll be next year, right? So... July the 4th is on a Wednesday next year, you know, just saying, 
just saying, praise God. But we had just come back Wednesday. In fact, on Wednesday, we had just come back from our Washington, D.C. trip to Kufa, our Christians United for Israel. What a trip. I'm sure some of you or a lot of you were watching our posts and seeing what was happening and the young people that came. I'm telling you it was wonderful, our biggest and best ever, 5,000 plus on the hill. I'm telling you, going, I think we, they said we covered all of the representatives and senators except for 15. Now, honey, that's hundreds of representatives. So we let them know that we were not only to stand for Israel, but we, let, we gave them some specifics on how to. We told them that it, we thought it was a really good idea to stop giving the Palestinian Authority money, which was then turned over to terrorists. Yeah, we think that's a good idea. You'd think you wouldn't have to say that, but we did, and it was important that we did say it. And so that was an important thing that we stood for, among other things. So we want to show you a video right now just to give you a sense and see a little bit of behind-the-scenes actions, especially with our young people. This is Pastor George and Terry. We are here at Washington's Kufi meeting, the annual meeting that they have here, and what an amazing time this has been. You know, Washington, D.C. is the heartbeat of the nation, and so how important it is for Christians to gather here to show support for Israel, which is the heartbeat of God. And so together, we're taking a stand and putting this nation on the right track to be in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing with the right people the right way. Amen. That's right. Amen. And I'm really here on the president's behalf and on our entire team's behalf to pay a debt of gratitude to all of you who helped elect a president who is fighting every single day to defend, faith, restore, freedom, and strengthen America's unbreakable bond with our most cherished ally, Israel. Christians all across the United States have come to the Capitol right here in Washington, D.C., and today they're meeting with their representatives concerning standing up and speaking up for the nation of Israel. You need someone to be your spokesperson, okay? And then you determine in that group how you will cover those two talking points. We're the students from Eagle Mountain International Church, and we are going to be talking to our representatives in Congress today to uh, lobby for the Taylor Force Act and the Israel Anti-Boycott Act. doing on the Taylor Force Act. We need to bring that up and we need to pass it. It should not be a complicated question that U.S. taxpayer funds shouldn't be going directly to fund terrorists. 
On top of that, I continue to hope and, and advocate for and look forward to celebrating the day that we move the American Embassy to where it belongs, which is Jerusalem. I would never have learned all the stuff that we're learning today if I had not come here. I am so happy that I came. I'm so happy that the people who helped me get here. It, none of this would have happened for me if I did not come. It's a one in a lifetime chance and you should definitely take it. This is truly a place where world impact begins, continues, and even ends. So make your plans to be a part of the KUFI Washington DC Summit next year and every time and in between be a KUFI member. Go to KUFICUFI.org. marvelous. Did you see that big group standing on the steps? That was Texas. I, I like being from Texas. They knew we were on the hill, let me tell you. Praise the Lord. Well, it's offering time. You know, I like being part of Texas because it's big, it's bold, it's beautiful. Don't be messing with Texas, right? Well, I like being part of Eagle Mountain International Church because it's big, it's bold, it's beautiful, and the devil better not be messing with Eagle Mountain. So if you missed Pastor Greg's message this morning in Faith Foundations, then you need to go back and listen to it and find out how to keep uh, and make sure that the devil don't be messing with you. Amen. So, offering time, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Now, I haven't been on this platform to do the offering in a long time. So, you better agree with me right now. You know. Not that I won't, that I can't think of something to say, but that I'll know when to stop. Hallelujah. Okay, chapter 8, verse 1. This is reading from the Amplified. We want to tell you further, brethren, about the grace. Now, what did we just say about grace? It's the power. It's many things. You can talk all day and night from now until Jesus comes and never exhaust all that grace is and all that grace will do. For it's the very nature and character of God at work and on display in our behalf. But the, the one definition that, that really encompasses it for me is that it's God's ability and his power given to us to, to be everything he wants us to be, to do everything he wants us to do, and to have everything he wants us to have, spirit, soul, and body. It's his generosity for that to happen. It's an amazing thing. And it's, it's th then our job is to explore discover, uncover all that he wants us to be, all that he wants us to do, and all that he wants us to have. So he says, to tell you further, brethren, about the grace, the favor and blessing of God, which has been evident in the churches of Macedonia. So he's writing to the Corinthians and he says, I'm going to talk to you about what has happened in the Macedonian church. And I like what the Amplified says. It expounds on the Greek, the sense of the Greek words here, and it says, arousing in them the desire to give. Stirring up in them the desire to give. So this is something that he said was a work of grace. Well, if grace is totally, 100%, without exception, absolutely, always, the love of God in motion towards us, then it can't be something that works against us. It can't be something that is harmful, or detrimental to us in any way. But it can be something that the natural mind can't figure out. It can be something that the world wants to argue with because the mindset and the, the thinking of the world is for you to be what the world wants you to be, 
to do things the way the world wants you to do them and for you to have what the world wants you to have, which is always in decreasing amounts. The world never wants you to wind up with anything. It wants you to be dependent on it and it never can fully supply. For in the midst of an ordeal of severe tribulation, their abundance of joy and their depth of poverty have overflowed in wealth of lavish generosity on their part. Like this word that here in verse 1, it says, this grace was evident. Somehow this grace, this that God wants them to be, to do, to have, it showed up in the midst of severe tribulation. Now think about the context in which Paul was saying this. Severe tribulation, or tribulation in general, you know, there's a reference point. For us, tribulation might be don't have enough money for this thing or that thing. Or the tribulation for us is on, a, and it can be very uh, full of anxiety or pressure. But tribulation in that world was live or die. Tribulation in that world was starve or survive. Tribulation in that world was the lion's den or not. Crucifixion or not. Persecution, slavery. Your children being taken away. It was persecution and oppression, depression and severity with no government net. In fact, the government could very well be your problem. So when he says severe tribulation, think about what all that could mean. So no matter what our tribulation is, we put it in comparison here. He's just saying that in the midst of the worst that you can think of or picture and the pressure would, would be, would, you, you probably can't even mentally imagine or conceive of it. But he said in the midst of that, what happened? There was an abundance of joy in the midst of very deep poverty. Well, didn't God care about them? Well, yes, he did. How do we know he did? Grace moved them. Grace moved them. Grace isn't a, a provision like like something that's over your head and suddenly everything you need is just dropped on you. Grace moves you in position for the blessing. It moves you, it moves you in the will of God. It moves you in the ways of God. God's blessing is his way. It's not, it's not a sudden squirt of something. It's not a sudden hit with a hammer. It's his way. The blessing is God's way. The kingdom of God is God's ways of doing. God's ways of being. And in his ways, every need is met. When you're doing things his way, his way is a love way. His way is a giving way. His, way, his ways towards us are always good. And because of that, grace moved them to flowing in the ways of God. And what did it move them to do? Moved them to give. I bear witness that they gave according to their ability and beyond their ability. How can you give beyond your ability? God gets involved. God finds a way. We know over just in the, the next chapter... He says, verse 10, chapter 9, verse 10, God provides seed for the sower, bread for the eater. And the, the um, King James says, he ministers seed. He ministers. He, 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 this tells us that what happened, they're giving, and then there was suddenly, some, somehow, some way, they could give more than they knew how they could give. God got involved in their giving. God got involved. What's that? That was the grace at work. Why? He had to get them into a place of giving. Why? To get them out of that poverty. Poverty never produces joy. 
Poverty is an outward expression of the spirit of death. It's, you know, you, know you, don't, you don't go to the poorest neighborhoods, the poorest parts of the country, and find out how they all live so long. You don't go there to find out how, how, they, how their health is so strong and abounding. You don't go to the poorest parts on the earth to see, to look and see about how great things are while little flies are, are all over and covering the children's faces. That's the work of poverty. But no joy comes as a result of this work of grace. And in this abundance of joy, abundance of joy, it says, they were giving and they, they got hold of this joy and began to give with joy. And out of that, God began to draw them out of that poverty and they were able to give beyond, beyond their ability. You know, we understand that there are certain professions, jobs, that pay more than others. We understand that there are people who retire, live on social security, and their income is, quote, limited. But this tells us that in that grace of giving, operating in God's grace, operating in his abundant ways, says that there is an elevation beyond what you should be able to do. The janitor shouldn't be able to put more in than the professional, the lawyer, the doctor, the rock star. But by the grace of God, we're able to do more than we're able to do. God, only in God. Verse 4, they were, and they did it voluntarily, begging us most insistently for the favor and the fellowship of contributing in this ministry of relief to the saints. They begged, let us be a part. He must have at first said no. They must have at first said, we, we, we realize that, man, you're, you're poor. You shouldn't be giving this much. Deuteronomy 14 tells us, be sure to bring your tithe. Well, we'd do it because God said to do it. But in chapter 15, it says, so that there will be no poor among you. God's on a mission. God's on a mission. And his mission is to eradicate lack in the life of any of his children and thereby eradicate lack in those that don't even know him yet. Hallelujah. 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 I want to read this to you. Friends, I want, this is from the message. I want to report on the surprising, generous ways in which God is working in the churches in Macedonia. Fierce troubles came down on those people and those churches pushing them to the very limit. The trial exposed their true colors. They were incredibly happy, though desperately poor. The pressure triggered something totally unexpected, an outpouring of pure and generous gifts. I was there and saw it for myself. They gave offerings of whatever they could and then far more than they could afford, pleading for the privilege of helping out in the relief of poor Christians. This was totally spontaneous, entirely their own idea, and caught us completely off guard. What explains it was that they had first given themselves unreservedly to God and to us. This is such an important element well, sometimes struggle with that kind of giving. They might, be, they might be moved in an offering or might respond. But that way of giving, walking in that grace of giving, just living, just, just give. Just see where they can give. You know, somebody says, I, re I really, I, I sure do like that purse you're carrying. Okay, well, you can have it. I sure do, I sure do like that tie. Okay, let me give it to you. Giving more. Giving more, looking for ways to be a blessing, to help. Generosity, living in the way of that kind of grace. And in giving that way, you become a harvester of that way. 
But this came, he said, it was a result of the fact they had, first of all, given themselves to God. Unreservedly given themselves to God. And as a result of that, had given themselves to the ministry, had given themselves to the leadership, had given themselves to their spiritual fathers. And so what do you need us to do? Around here, we might call that volunteer. We might call that serving in the children's ministry. We might call that helping at the Southwest Believers Convention. We might call that following. So when convention comes up and it's time to go to convention, well, just bless God, we're going. Yeah, but it's hard to do. Yeah, but I don't care. Yeah, but I work until 6 o'clock. Yeah, well, we made peanut butter sandwiches and packed them up, and we're all going. And all the yell butts in the world don't outweigh giving ourselves totally to God and the leaders that he had put in front of us. I'm not telling you anything we haven't done. not telling you anything we haven't done time and again. Pack them up, haul down. But I, I'm telling you we have done, we've done the hard thing. Some things may be harder for others than it ever was for us, but we, we, we pressed. We pressed. And that lifestyle, that lifestyle of giving to him puts you in a position for grace to stir more in you. Grace to move you into God's ways. Grace to move you towards giving. Grace to stir your heart. And grace that by faith, it, it just gra- grace... That's faith. When you're, when you're in the flow of grace, I tell you, they're giving with one hand and receiving with another. Giving with one hand, receiving with another. With everything you receive, there's more giving. More giving, there's more receiving. And it just becomes something that's moving and moving until you just find out you're racing towards the prize of the high calling of being just like Jesus. Just like him. Just like him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for this blessing of grace that stirs in us and moves us. It moves us to serve one another. It moves us to serve you. It moves us to be led by the Spirit. It moves us to be led by the Spirit in our leaders. It moves us in hunger towards the Word of God. It moves us to put the things of God first, foremost, now and forever. It trains us in the ways of God. You said, Lord, that you are not willing to do without a cheerful, prompt-to-do-it giver. You weren't willing to do without that Macedonian church. And you blessed them so that supernaturally they were able to do more than they should have ever been able to do. Lord, that's us. That's us. That's me. That's me. Say, that's me. That's me. me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So, as you bring your tithe today, the tenth of your income, or offerings, I want you to know your offerings are at work. We're working on things, and we'll be updating you soon. I am excited to tell you that the plans are moving forward for the completion of the Student Life Center, which will include Kenneth Copeland Bible College. Hallelujah. I'm telling you right now, we're taking bids on the new chairs for this auditorium. Hallelujah. (laughs) Things are happening. So your offerings and your, your gifts, they're working. They're working. Hallelujah. And we're, and then this is the last thing we're praying. And I want your, your face set right now. And I believe we'll have an amount to share with you next week. The seed that this church will sow going into the Southwest Believers Convention. We're going to go into it taking a big bite out of that budget. Do you agree? Amen. Amen. So if you're giving this morning online, you may click to emic.org slash give. emic.org forward slash give. Or you can text to give 36609. Just put that in as the number, 36609. And then type in E-M-I-C and the amount. E-M-I-C and the amount. If you've never done that before, it'll ask you one time about your credit card or debit card information. Then you won't ever have to do that part again. If you're writing a check today, make it payable to E-M-I-C. If you need an offering envelope for cash credit or debit giving, you want a record, then please raise your hand. Our ushers will give you one. Or you can look under the seat 
in front of you. Now, as we get ready to sing, we're going to be giving. We're giving in joy. We're giving in faith. Come on now. How are we giving? In joy. In faith. Believing that the grace of God is at work. And because of that, we are expecting a miracle. <laughs> I'm expecting a miracle. How about you? Did you come believe it to receive it today? Well, today is a good day. Let's reach out and take it right now by faith. Help us sing this song. I'm looking for a miracle.
Let's pray over these precious ties and these... <laughs> what do you have in your basket over there? What is this? We're going fishing. <laughs> we are going fishing. Well, isn't that something? My goodness. What else is in these baskets over here? Oh, there's a fish over there. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice indeed. <laughs> Big fish. Say this after me. Because we are tithers. Because we are tithers. The windows of heaven are open. And the blessing is pouring out. Because we are sowers. We are furnished in abundance. For every good work. We receive jobs or better jobs. Raises and bonuses. <clears throat> Benefits, sales, and commissions. Settlements, estates, and inheritances. Interest and income. Rebates and returns. Checks in the mail. Supernatural wealth transfer. Bills paid off. Debts demolished, royalties received, and properties acquired. We are getting our buildings, our lands, our houses, our vehicles, our equipment, our airplanes. We call into this ministry a Gulf Stream 5 right now. In the name of Jesus, God is bringing into our hands seed, even some great big whopper chunk seed. We command our harvest to come. Harvest, come to us now. Harvesting angels, go get it. Bring it to us. Right now, in Jesus' name, say this after me. I am increasing more and more every day. I declare the devil. I receive supernatural, provisional miracles. Now give God praise for that. That's right. This is the day. That's this is the day. <laughs> this is the day. Oh, come on, come on, give God praise and honor and thanks.
Thanksgiving. Hallelujah! Whoa! Whoa! I want you to release your faith right now over this Believers Convention. We are, by the word of the prophet, believing for over one million dollars over the budget. Way over the budget. Way over the budget. So let's agree right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, over this magnificent convention that is coming up, we all set ourselves in agreement together with the prophet right now. As Brother Copeland has declared, over $1 million over the budget. Over the budget. Say over the budget. Over a million dollars. Over the budget. And I receive what I need. Way over my budget. <laughs> In the name of Jesus. Oh, let's thank the Lord for that. Thank you, Father. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. You guys can go ahead and be seated. How good it is to see you. What a time it is to be together like this. I tell you, the Lord is so good to us. He is so good to us. Before I get into the word today, though, I want to... I want to introduce some friends of mine who have come here all the way from Australia. Some of you know them, some of you may not, but uh, Ian and Penny Britza have been friends of mine for a long, long time, long, long time. Come on, guys, come on up here. Come on up here. Look at her. Look. Come on, come on, come on. Give them a hand. Come on up. Yeah, come on up. Oh, come on. Let them know. Welcome them home. Oh, man, it is so good to have you guys with us. It's been a long time since you and I have seen each other. And Ian and I go way back together, many years, and so thrilled that the Lord put you and Penny together. And what a team. What an amazing, amazing team. And I just wanted you to greet the folks and just give them an update on what's going on and what's happening. And, and of course, uh, Samuel is with them, their son Samuel. And uh, he's a... He's an older version of Justice. That's what he is. It's amazing. Curly, blonde hair and everything. And, and what a treasured, treasured, treasured relationship this is. So just greet the folks and say a few words if you would. Here, we'll stand over here. While you... <laughs> uh, first of all, it's wonderful to be back. And the spirit's wonderful, actually. But I thought, Hammond B3? Is that a Hammond we have up here? Yeah. A B3, yeah. There's, there's one right there. Yeah, well, that takes me back a long time, you know. In the early days, I used to do concerts Is on organs. Right? Yeah, yeah, a long time ago. Um, I, I enjoyed the music today. Now, I've got to tell you something. I'm showing my age. I have got no idea what the new praise and worship songs are like. So when someone throws in a hymn, I go, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and then when Terry said... Sing it sweetly. I thought, oh, she did it for me. Yeah. So I want to tell you, I really got into it today. And I want to say thank you. But I wanted to say thank you to this church. Um, now, before I do that, Pastor George and Terry. Now, you know, early 90s is when God put uh, George and I together. And um, I, I'll say it like this. I won't go any further. You know why? Because it's none of your business. I know you're not offended with that, but um, God brought George and I together because I needed to protect Kenneth Copeland Ministries in Australia. So when uh, George came out to Australia to deal with that issue, God put us together. And you know what? Just because God put you together doesn't, I mean, not God, just because you come together doesn't mean it's God. You have to prove your friendship. I know people don't like to hear that. But it's true. And there's only one exam that can prove a friendship. I hope you're really listening. Only a crisis will prove your friendship. It's a dreadful exam. I, don't, I was never praying for it. I was never believing for it. But you only know who your friends are when you hit a crisis. When there's a choice for you to stay with your friend... Or to say, I don't want to know you. Now this church, some of you have known me for a long time. 
You knew me when the world would say I was at my height. Well, I think I'm at my height now. But back then, you know, uh, they said a big shot's only a little shot away from home. <laughs> and, uh, but you treated me like a big shot and uh, you were very gracious to me, honourable to me. But then I lost everything that was dear to me. Someone said, come, come to MIC and we'll protect you because I'd lost my marriage. And I went, who told you I needed protection from these wild women? <laughs> it may not be politically correct, but I'm going to tell you what I was thinking. Let these wild women come. <laughs> that's, now that's what I was thinking. All right. And, uh, but you saw me at my lowest, and I remember the church had cell groups or home groups, Pastor Terry. And you know what? Um, I joined one of them. And you know what? I was still treated very honorably, but I needed to be loved. I needed to be touched. And that home group looked after me. They touched me. They loved me. They called me Ian instead of Pastor. And I needed that. And, um, and God in his mercy and grace sent Penny to me. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, um, this church saw me fall in love. And I know you are laughing. And George reckons that I was an absolute juvenile. And, uh, but in that dark moment before Penny came into my life, in that very dark moment, I'd lost the ability to laugh and just to enjoy. I, I'd lost everything. I didn't know what to do. And George and I went on a mandate. Are you, are you allowed to say that? Are you allowed to say that? <laughs> Terry agreed, I think. And he took me to see my fat Greek wedding. And we just laughed and laughed and laughed. I remember what my father said. He said two things. He said, Ian, um, and of course, Dad was, well, he wasn't Baptist, but he said they were the closest to what he believed at the time. But he said, Ian, if you're going to choose a deacon, you've got to trust the wife first. If you trust the wife, then you can trust the man. And so as my 21-year-old mind was thinking on that, he said, well, if you trust a woman, why don't you have her on board anyway? And so when I thought about George, I thought about Terry, because I didn't know Terry. Because she's like a father, scares the daylights out of you. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. And I'm not talking about fear and natural. I'm talking about the, when those eyes are looking at you, you better be telling the truth. That's what, that's what you better be doing. All right, you better be honest because it, it sees right through. But you know, I, know, I knew that George had married a good woman. And you know what, when a, when a husband and wife are safe, you are then able to give compliments. And we've lost the art of giving compliments. And it's, it's a, just a wonderful nugget. And, and having such a beautiful woman, I couldn't think straight when she came into my life. I don't know if I'm allowed to be real here, George, but I want to say something. You know, when Penny came into my life, I wasn't singing Amazing Grace. <laughs> I, I wasn't singing How Great Thou Art and Glory Hallelujah. You know what I was doing? I, I'm an old Beatles boy. I was singing, I want to hold your hand. I mean, I, 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 I was singing those old Beach Boy numbers. I, I was singing Nat King Cole, you know. When, when I fall in love, it'll be forever, for heaven's sakes. You know why? Because I'd never fallen in love before. I didn't know what it was like. Passion was growing in me, and I didn't know, how, how, do, you how do you get through that when you're in love? Well, this is what I want to share with you, is that that's what accountability is all about. First of all, that's why you've got mum and dad. If you don't listen to them, well, you're history and you're stupid, right? <laughs> oh, mum and dad, I hope you're okay, you're right, right? 
but also God gives you pastors to go to because when you're in love and you start saying, God told me, we all, we all raise our eyes and go, yeah, right. Because how do you argue with God told me? How do you argue with that? You have to go to men that you trust and say, you know what? I'm absolutely in love. When she holds my hand, I'm, I, I ain't thinking about Jesus. I'll give you the tip. <laughs> we, uh, please be real here. Please be real here, right? Okay. And you know what? I didn't care. I didn't care what color. I didn't care what country. Just give me one of those women that are wild. That's what I was, you know, you may think that's not good preaching and that's not faith, but that's what I was thinking. And if you're thinking like that and you don't have accountability, you'll make some bad decisions. And when we finally got married, uh, Deanne and Michael, but Deanne made, oh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, otherwise everyone else will think you can do it. But she was part of that, you were part of that group that just loved on me. And when we got married over there at the chapel, they made our cake. And the home group that looked after me took care of everything in that chapel. How can I forget? How can I forget? And so you saw me fall in love with this woman. You saw me get up on my feet and then blow me down. She, I'm blaming her, you know, I'm being scriptural, Adam blamed her woman, right? She says, your destiny is in Australia. And in my heart, I thought, well, if it is, you go there. <laughs> Australia was very mean to me. They sent some terrible emails. Ministers, men of God, ministry. And I, there was one email I got that was so terrible, I showed George. And right there on the front row, he wrote the reply and said, this is how you need to respond. I said, give me a break. That is so soft. <laughs> I ain't sending that but I did because a soft answer turns away wrath but you know I was angry I was upset I didn't know where I was going I was, didn't know what to do and um, I went into politics and I went into politics kicking and screaming pushed by this woman they told me I was running for a seat that was impossible to win um, I'll use American terminology. I was a Republican running in a Democratic seat that had never been won by a Conservative, and I won it. And then held it for two terms. And uh, the people had a good man, but I was blaming her all the time. And um, I remember um, uh, Brother Copeland. Uh, you know, a lot of people think that, that I live in that man's pocket, and I don't. I mean, I've only had one lunch with that gentleman. It was with Creflo Dollar, and I just shut up the whole time. <laughs> and I wasn't going to say nothing. I was going to show how stupid I was. <laughs> you know, I just stayed right put. But, I, but, I, but he sent me an email, um, and I won't share the message because it was very personal. It was very precious to me. And then he sent me a Bible, and he wrote in it. And I gave my oath to my state and parliament on that Bible the first time. And then I gave it the second time. And it sat on my table in my parliament for the whole eight years. I, I'm still hopelessly in love. We, so, and um, I'm, I'm hopelessly, I'm absolute dead gone. I'm hopelessly in love. I keep thinking, somehow this honeymoon is going to break. Not, not passionate. When my daughter-in-law came to me to tell me that she was falling in love with my son, Yes. I said, well, I've got one question for you. Now, I'm going to go over here because it's not a question that you'll ever hear in church much. And it's politically incorrect. So I'm just warning you, all right? <laughs> Jessica, do you want to rip the clothes off my boy? And, and I tell you what, <laughs> it's true. Well, you know why? Because, because I've seen a lot of... Husbands and wives. And hours and hours in the word of God and you can't give your husband nothing? Shut up! <laughs> now that's good preaching. I better come back. I'm a politician now. The gift is still on you when I went into parliament. You're still a pastor. The former prime minister of Australia, John Howard, when I went to meet him, he shook, when, when I left his meeting, he shook me by the hand and he said, go back to your electorate 
and, and deal with your constituents like we can't. And I said, oh, how do we party? And I know that this is going everywhere, so who knows how, where it will turn up. It may be on the front page of the newspaper by the time I get home, but um, <laughs> she, re she belonged to a party. But she had an affair with our treasurer. Black o'clock at night. And I remember I, she was sitting behind me and, and I turned around and I said, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. I said, don't give me that. You've lost your husband. You've lost your children. Your whole situation, big tears were pathetic. But as a woman, she'd lost everything. How would you like your laundry? Put one to see. That, Penny and I were, we were uh, laying awake and no, we were in bed. Uh, we were asleep and, and my phone went off at 4.30 on a Sunday morning. Well, you shouldn't have your phone on anyway, but I did, and it was that I can trust. Will you help me? 4.30 in the morning. Why can't... So I said, I'll be, give me half an hour and I'll pick you up, we'll go for a ride. And we went for a five, six hour ride in the car. A door in Parliament, in his office. And they would just have a, we'd just talk. And it was, it was really precious. Where did I learn these things from? Well, you know what? You can have them, but unless people believe in you, unless we believe in office. And you know, so we're not allowed to pray for people, politically incorrect. But I've had people come into my office, especially seniors, dealing with a fence issue, with local on the piano for you. What, 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 how, what, where, where? And I'd just go and minister on the piano and they'd be in tears. These are people that don't know Jesus from a rock. So I'm just saying to you that that phrase, the gifts and callings of God are without repentance, is very real. If you don't, uh, that's old school thinking. And dad passed away in 1976. But that is a truth that he shared. And you know, men have to step up to the plate. And I only remember two things my dad said. That first one was a real golden nugget. The second one I don't think I enjoyed too much because I was only 16. But you know what he said? I had just awoken up and realised that girls were around. Sisters, next week, humma, humma, humma. <laughs> they all looked outstanding. You know, all of them, all of them. And I, and I couldn't understand why. But you know what? Dad knew. Dad knew something had happened. Now, this is old school. He said, never forget women. No, girls are not apples on a tree to take a bite out of and throw away. Yeah, it was at my school. And there were, because boys didn't treat. Still wanted one, though. So here it is, this, this gift to just love disintegrating. The most condemning people of all are church people. And it shouldn't be the case or whether you're wrong. They never said that. They just said, we love you. By somebody, we just love you. You cannot imagine how much that felt. I'd come into this church, a love offering, and I never understood because you know what? The natural mind thinks you give a love offering to someone who's blessed you or, you know, we get very selfish with those things. But uh, this church just loved me for who I was. Never forgot it. It helped me when I went into politics to love people, Pastor George, for just who they were. I had my first fundraiser. I had over 500 people at this fundraiser, but the media only remembered the 12 prostitutes that came. <laughs> and I took Penny. I thought, this is, go over here and see Mary Ann Kenworthy. And she took us and introduced us to every girl. And then the very last one, and afterwards I rang and a, week, a week later and said, what? But on the other hand, every one of them knows that if they were in trouble, you would come and help. And yet that in the church, over 30 this church, because something's happened, there's a, there's a different spirit. There's a, there's a joyful spirit here. Don't judge so quickly. When you hear about it, when you hear about it, and you shouldn't because it's none of your business, 
But when you hear about a marriage or a relationship breaking up, it's none of your business because you don't know. What I'm telling you right now, that man in your heart. Just, just love, just love people. That doesn't mean you're condemned. Hello, hello. Did I hear an amen or oh dear or oh me? It's the same God who said, if you're going to go. Now, that's good preaching. I think that's enough, I reckon. That's enough for you to go think about. And I'm just going to share one more story, George, and then you can relax. Because I said, <laughs> God help you. But, you know, but I want to talk. I just want to share something. And I don't want to embarrass my wife because she's very gracious. But number one, you need to know, I was 23. I had never experienced any intimacy. Now, I know we may have done something because I've got two boys. So we did something. So I'm going to make a phrase. I'm going to... I'm going to sh- you, you can have sex in your marriage or you can make love. Two very, very, very important things. Lack of experience, um, 15%, because you women, you just got to know. It takes us men weeks to pluck up the courage. <laughs> And we're, we are in deep intercession for one week to hope that you... Now, you may think, and I shouldn't be preaching this stuff this morning. Well, you know what I am. <laughs> and the reason I... I we're scared of rejection. We were scared that... that uh, something wrong with him, I'll tell you that right now. We men are like... You know, there used to be a battery in the old days called Ever Ready. I reckon we men are like those batteries. We're ever ready. We're in. We're in. We're in. I may be tired. I may be dog tired, but I'm ready. Right? Well, you know, I remember, and I say all that to just tell you that she's looked after me. And you know what? When when she looks after me that way, I'm thinking in my mind, what can I do to be a better husband? What 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 can I do? And it's hard being a father at my age. To a nine-year-old, you know, our boy's gorgeous. Everyone loves him and all that stuff, but he's nine. (laughs) And he's wearing these pants that he won't let go, but it's got holes in it. (laughs) I go into a shop and I see jeans that they're paying 150 bucks for and they've got holes in them. (laughs) I'm showing my age. I'm telling you right now, I'm showing my age. But you know what? Um... When I think about, I'm thinking about whenever Penny looks after me, I'm thinking, what can I do? That's when I'm the most vulnerable to be asked a question. Now, if you're absolutely, totally led by your flesh and not by the spirit, I'll give you a hot tip. If you make love to your husband, that's after that, that is the time to ask him what you want. Because <laughs> he's, by that time, he's happy. <laughs> He'll do whatever you want. <laughs> Generally speaking, but one time uh, Parliament was going dreadfully. It was two o'clock in the morning, and the opposition, every one of the opposition wanted to speak, which means half an hour each, and they took the whole time on a bill that they agreed with us to pass, but they wanted to speak their opposition, tell us how daft we were, how stupid we are, but they still voted for it. And I was frustrated. But you've got to understand, finally Parliament rises and I'm out of Parliament at 2.30 in the morning. Now, I'm leaving at 2.30, but my brain's all... I'm not... I, I'm, I'm jealous of the post hole diggers. You know, if, if you're a farmer, I'm jealous of you because your tiredness is physical tiredness. So, you know, you have a good sleep. That's wonderful. But when there's this mental stuff going, I went home... Mentally frazzled. Normally I go past my office and I play the piano for an hour before I go home just to settle down and, and relax. And I was still, I was still in, in, I climbed into bed, you know, everyone's asleep and whatever have you. And uh, I'm going to say it this way because it was. At, at that time in the morning, my wife says, let me minister to you. And I know she ain't going to go sing a song. I don't want to hear no song at 2.30 in the morning. But you know what? I remember 
I just thought, no, hey, I went to sleep real quickly after that, let me tell you. But anyway, but you know what the thought was? I thought, I didn't have to say anything. I didn't have to say anything. She just said, you're my husband, I know that whatever it has you, this is what I can do, and I do it willingly. Now, it, it ought to be taught, it ought to be shared, but it's a real precious thing to me, and that's what enabled me to minister and genuinely give compliments to, to women who deserve compliments. Now, you can get a compliment from a man and he's flirting. All right? But ladies, for heaven's sakes, how can you spend 250 bucks on a haircut and no one notice? Yeah, thank you. I don't know where that came from, but I agree. I mean, for heaven's sakes, how can you do that? How can you spend so much money? And you know what? I'd walk down the main street of Perth and, and you pass a thousand women in seven minutes. And, and it just happens this way, but one would, one would just stick out above the rest. It would be either her hair, and I'm into dresses, and, or nice pair of shoes. Have I complimented a uh, woman on her shoes? Oh, man. If I was a younger bloke, I'd have it made. <laughs> but I didn't know these things now, right? And I love hats. Now, I'm going to say something that's not politically correct. I may have said a lot of stuff today that's not politically correct. <laughs> but I'm going to say it today. And, uh, but this is not politically correct, all right? I'm really big time. I really love hats. I see a hat. Ha <laughs> ha. Woohoo! You're in. I mean, I'm like, oh man. And you know, the only people who wear hats are black people. I went to a church in Alabama and preached many years ago, Pastor George, and those women wore hats and they looked mighty fine. <laughs> and uh, one of the privileges of being in Parliament was that when the Queen, and that's our president, okay, but the Queen came. God bless the Queen. And the Queen came <laughs> and we were invited to a garden tea party with the Queen. But there's protocol when you meet the Queen. And the protocol is you have to wear a hat. Now, Penny had to go buy a dress. Well, that's nothing, you know. But, you know, when a woman goes out, it's not just buying a dress. You've got to buy shoes, you've got to buy bags, you've got to buy a whole lot of stuff. But one thing she had to get was a hat. And, you know, she finally settled on an outfit and she wore a hat. Oh, my gosh, George, she looked stunning. And you know what? There were more people coming around to say hello to her than going to meet the Queen. <laughs> My colleagues kept looking at her, and I knew they weren't looking at her character. <laughs> they, they just, well, she was, well, I'm going to say it. She is looking hot. <laughs> you know what that is, don't you? Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, uh, there's a great proverb in, the, in, in talking about women. There's a great proverb uh, in the message translation talking about women. And, and <laughs> I, I think I'm too scared to say what I'm going to say. But it's the, it's the message. It's not me. It's not me. It's not me. It's the message. You go look in Proverbs yourself and find it. Describes as a woman being frigid. Now, I know you, you men are too scared to say amen right now. And you ought to be. And I understand that. But... But you know what? I remember Penny saying to me, don't be upset about those guys. She said, it's a compliment to you. And I tell you, 14 years we've been married, I've never gone to bed, ever, ever, without thinking, my God, I go to sleep next to this woman. Never, not once, ever. I used to come over here to America before. I could come over here for two months and not even think twice about home. You know why? Because there's no love and waiting for me. I, I, I'm pretty good for three days. Pretty good. I could pretty well handle it for three days. But after that, I've got to get home to mama. <laughs> i just got to get home. You know, I love me boy. And, and when I put my boy to bed and I say, Samuel, I love you, but you're not even close to the love I have for your mother. You're not even close. 
and you can't marry her. Because he wants to marry his mother. And I kept telling him, you can't do that, boy. She's already taken. When I got elected to my electorate, I told my electorate, you can trust me as your member of parliament because you know why? Because I love my wife. It's true. So, here we go. Um, I lost the election and no one was ever more relieved than me. I think I was disappointed, not devastated, but disappointed for 24 hours and then Penny and I, we thought, oh my gosh, we're free. No more paper. You know, the last headline of me on my local paper, headlines on, on the front page, me. You know what they called me? A rebel. Me. <laughs> Ian Britzer, a rebel MP. The headlines, rebel MP calls Premier to account. <sighs> well, you know what? It was accountability because what our Premier said wasn't right. It was nothing big deal. It just wasn't the truth. Someone had to say it. But you know what? We're free. And I said to Penny, I know that this is, you know, and the election was held in March this year and, and we got defeated. And it's a long story. But as we got together, I said, I don't think that my political life is finished. I don't, I get in the spirit that it's not right. Anyway, it may go all around the world now and I'm going to be history, George, but I'm going to be running for the Senate. And, uh, I hope it sends shockwaves back home because uh, senators and politicians don't have good reputations for actually representing their people. They represent their parties more than you. I'm telling you that right now. I know. Do they really care about you? No, they care about their party's platform. So when you pray for your politician, know what he believes. Does he know who you are? I, I, there's one, I'm thinking about one ornery woman. That's a constituent. I won't mention her name because you never know. She just might hear it. I mean, every second word was a foul swear word. Every second word. I mean, foul as could be. I mean, she scared me. And she would come in, but she wouldn't speak to any other person except me in Britain. And she would come in. I don't want to speak to... And she'd call my staff names. I just... Only, only Mr. Britzer will help me. And I'm thinking, I don't want to help you. I'm scared of you. And she was rough. She didn't like the police. She didn't like anybody, whatever. But Mr. Britzer could do no wrong. You know why? just simply because I cared. I listened to her and I helped her on one issue and as far as she was concerned, I would become the fourth member of the Godhead, but she wouldn't use that terminology. <laughs> so, you know, I want to tell you, pray for your politicians. You know what, I, I don't know what your political affiliation is, but this is, I know you're hearing it and you may have heard this a while, I'm going to close with this because it's about your president. And I'm a politician. I was in hospital the night he got elected. And I was awake at 12 midnight when the nurses station declared, oh my gosh, Mr. Trump's won the presidency. What are we going to do? And I yelled out, because my bed was right next to the nurses station. And I yelled out, we're going to rejoice. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> and, and they said, why, why is that? I said, well, I'll tell you why. And, and I, I'm going to blame this woman over here because I heard her say it and I've used it as mine now. She said, I said, we, we, America now has a president who's not a politician. You may not fully understand what that actually means, but you are a blessed nation. And any time the left and Hollywood are against you, it's a good sign that things are going good. So, to all of the men and women that actually voted for this man when everyone else was saying no, I can tell you the Jewish community in my, in, in my uh, city of Perth are thrilled with this man. They told me, in my maiden speech, I gave honour to America and I gave honour to Israel. 
and said, I, I, my allegiance is to both. And uh, I never thought in my wildest dreams that I'd be marrying a Texan. <laughs> no, <Nah, yeah. laughs> but you know what? I, I tell you what, I was praying. When I knew that my marriage was finished, and that was long before the official announcement, but when I knew that it was finished, I started praying because I thought, no way. I, now, you women, you, you may be pretty good at staying single, but not us blokes. We, 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 need, we need a woman. And I started praying for a woman, and I said, Lord, I need a woman with backbone. I need a woman that will speak her mind, and I need a woman that's passionate. So he gave me a Texan. <laughs> now, now, now we, we were believing. Well, the lady, the woman that was putting us together, she will fault too, Annette. But anyway, when she was putting us together, she said, I ain't, I'm not going to put you together with, uh, uh, with Penny unless, unless you're willing to help give her a child. Now, I'll tell you something. We men, we, we like making babies. That's the good part, we think. But then to be a father, to actually take responsibility to be a father, when I already had grandchildren? Excuse me. <laughs> well, I actually thought about it. And then I went, okay. So, you know, I, I said, I'll do my part and we'll let God do his part. Now, she had two miscarriages. And the second one was particularly hurtful because we had an adoption in our hands. And it was going to be a girl. And I wanted a girl desperately. I wanted all you dads, you get kisses from your girls. I wanted that. I was jealous of you dads that have got girls. Girls love their dads, and, and I wanted a bit of that. I needed that. Bad. My grandbabies give me that. And uh, we, we thought we had it, but this girl decided that she wanted to come back to Dallas. So we took her to the Austin airport and said goodbye. We thought she was going to go see her mum come back. She left and gave the baby to someone else. And at the airport, Penny had her second miscarriage. We had to bring the ambulance in. She had to go to Austin Hospital. I was mad. Was that right? It was a bad day. Was a bad day. <laughs> we went to Florida. Thank God for Florida. I think that's where Samuel was conceived. So we thank God for Florida. <laughs> and um, anyway, the baby, I said, I want the baby born in Texas. You know, I want our son born in Texas. And, and you know what? Uh, she carried the third time and um, a week before Samuel was born, we were calling him Austin Samuel and the Holy Spirit wrote me up in the middle of the night and said, you've named him the wrong name. You need to, his name needs to be Samuel because of the call I have on his life. So I, I told Penny the next morning, he said, we got his name back to front. Now I've got to tell you something about Penny's mother whose maiden name is Austin. Her family is related to Stephen Austin. I've got Texas in my blood somewhere. <laughs> and then we named him Samuel. I mean, Sam Houston, give me a break. Our Texas is our boy. So he was born in Lano, Texas. And when he, when he tells people what are you, he says, he doesn't say I'm American. He says, I'm a Texan. <laughs> so I'm outnumbered in my house. I've got a Texas wife. I've got a Texas son. It's about time I was made an honorary Texan. I need, <laughs> need to speak to your government. I've been here enough time. And uh, so what I wanted to share is that this is, this is why your president is so special. Pray for him. You know, he's, any, any man that looks after Israel, you know, it doesn't matter his background. When, when all that stuff was coming about him, I'd say to Penny, well, you know, all that stuff about the women and all that stuff. Penny said, he's a man for crying out loud. And guess what? He did something that very few politicians do. He admitted it. <laughs> oh, you, you, you just don't realise how wonderful that is. <laughs> to have a man that says, yeah, that's me, I did that. Don't believe it anymore. I shouldn't have done it, maybe, but I did it. What politician says that? Except me. You just have to admit you're wrong. You have a wonderful man in that White House. And the prayers, yes, you do. 
and the prayers of the body of Christ and the prayers of the leaders that are here surrounded around him is really important. And I've got just one last message to the people that have seen the president. You know, if, you, if God ever opens the door for you to see the president, don't tell the whole world. Billy Graham learned a real important lesson with Mr. Truman. Mr. Truman asked him to come to office and he prayed and asked Billy Graham to pray for him. And as soon as Billy Graham got out of the office, the reporters got a hold of Billy Graham and said, what happened? He said, oh, we prayed for the president. And he went all around everywhere and Mr. Truman refused Billy Graham ever to come back to the White House. You know, when God, when God puts men and women in the place of other men and women in the old sales talk who can say yes or no, who've got major responsibility and you're praying for them, it's no one else's business. You, you've got no idea what spiritual pressure you then put on the very man that you're trying to bring up before the Lord. Now, you've got a strong man because he's not easily pushed around, Pastor. But I'm just, I want to say it out here that if you're going to pray or be with this man, I hope you never find out that I'm with, if I ever, he's the only president I've ever wanted to meet. I'd love to meet this man because, you know why? I trust him. But I hope you never find out about it till after he's dead. And maybe I'm gone and you just read it in a book that I had a cup of tea with the bloke. But he's a good man. Pray for him. I mean, his security department have got a job now. Your defence are, are walking with pride. My premier, my premier, who didn't think that I supported him too well, was cornered by reporters. And after he gave the press release with me sitting right next, standing right next to him, they said, Premier, what do you think about the Trump? That's how they said it. What do you think about the Trump presidency? Just a week after it happened, he said three things. Number one, he said, never forget he got elected fair and square. Well, that was a good point, I thought. Number two, let's give him one year. Let's find out whether he does anything before we throw rocks. Let's give him one year. And I'm thinking, it's not bad for my left leaning conservative leader. I wonder what the third point is. And he said, You know what the third point is? And, he, and this is what I want to leave you with, and I'll give it, this mic back to Pastor George. He said, What leader of a state or a country shouldn't put their people first? shouldn't put their people first. I don't know who is advising your president, but he's actually putting you first. And I heard in the papers a couple of weeks ago, Europe jumping up and down going, why are you leaving us? It reminds me of that, my fat Greek wedding. Why you leave me? Well, Europe are crying, why are you leaving? Well, you know what? You're not carrying your weight. You're not carrying your part of the responsibility. You do your part, we'll do our part. Sounds like God to me. And the president is saying, I want to look after America. I want to make sure America gets back on its feet. I want to make sure that the people are safe. They are secure. I want to make sure that our veterans are looked after. I want to make sure that oh, seniors are looked after. Uh, I want to make sure that, that we live in a country where if you dream it, you can do it. If you say it, you can have it. What president ever said that? I haven't heard one in my lifetime. Maybe Ronald Reagan. Maybe Ronald Reagan, but this is a president that's actually speaking faith, whether he knows it or not. I'll be honest with you, I don't know who's in his ear, but I enjoy it every time he tweets. Drives the left nuts, but I get to hear what he's saying and what he's thinking. It's a wonderful thing. Pray for him. You are a blessed nation. Thank you for those of you who remembered me and those many years ago. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for accepting Penny and I. Um, I want you to give the uh, message to Brother Copeland and Gloria for me because they accepted us. Now, some of you may think, well, what point is that? Well, you know what? It's our father in the faith. You want your father in the faith to say, that's okay. <laughs> you don't want your family or your friends to go into deep intercession when you say, I'm going to marry this person. <laughs> oh, my God, here we go. Let's pray. <laughs> no, you want them to rejoice. 
And uh, they did. They supported us, George, as you and Terry did. Just loved us for who we were. And you allowed me to fall in love with this beautiful woman. I won't give her age, except she's over 50. I think she's the hottest looking 50 year old I've ever seen in my entire life. And um, I want to tell you, my role is to look after her. My role is to, to take care of her. My responsibility is to do whatever is right. Your wife asked me to step in here. Uh, so why don't we step up to the front? You got something to say? <laughs> yeah, Are you sure? Yeah, go ahead, begin to play. I'll tell you, this was the message today. I think I'll just put my stuff up here. And uh, I don't, I don't know if it's because they enjoyed you so much or they don't have to sit through more preaching from me. But nonetheless, you spoke to so many different things on, on so many different levels. That's why I was standing back here just listening to you and I could, as their pastor, I could literally feel those words going down and touching the hearts. That pastor is so alive on the inside of you. And it's amazing when we have pastors who become politicians but actually are operating out of that pastoral anointing because that's what they do. That's what they should do. They should shepherd the people. So I want you to step up here. And, and one of the areas that you talked about was relationships and marriages. I want you to take a few moments and pray over everybody that's here and pray over the people that are watching us right now, over their marriage relationships. We've got people here. On, on every different level, married, not married, in between marriages, on the verge of divorce, going through divorce. I mean, it's just so many different things. But the wonderful thing about what you were saying to me was that we love one another, we accept one another, we help one another out. That's the big thing. So I want you to pray over my congregation and the congregation that's watching us, over their marriages, families, and relationships. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. I want your young people, when the time comes for them to fall in love, yeah. with all of my heart, It's hard to say with any emotion. <laughs> I want you young people and single people, people who are available to fall in love again, I want you to experience the passion that I thought experience it I was ready to go to my grave before the Lord having never experienced the love of a woman I don't want anyone to, to do that I don't want my sons to experience that I now that I've experienced passion that come from God I want you to have that all the days of your life. I want to grow old. I actually want to grow old with this woman and her to hold my hand when I'm in my mid-80s and still get a tingle. 
That's what I'm praying about. That's what's real to me. And remember, how can you fall in love with Christ with a passionless heart? How can you do that? C.S. Lewis said that he was the most miserable of Christians because he made a mathematical decision to serve Christ. You see, if, you, if your relationship started with genuine passion, life will come across your marriage and it'll put pressure on your marriage and your passion may be misplaced. But that's all it is. It's just misplaced. All you have to do is find it. All you have to do is remember. Oh, I remember. It doesn't sound very spiritual, I know. But I remember when I had the hots for that guy. I remember when I, I loved that girl. I couldn't wait to get home and rip her clothes off. I know you don't hear that stuff in church, but you've got to remember that when it's misplaced and lost, you've got to remember what you had. And if you never had that in the first place, what happens to you? When, when the enemy comes and tries to destroy your marriage, and there was no passion in the first place. Why do you think that, I, I say Baptist churches, but they have rededication services because you know why? People have lost their passion. And, they, and, and the preacher is saying, get that back so you can fall in love with Jesus again. Remember what it was like the first time when you fell in love with Jesus. Your whole life changed. You wanted to tell the whole world. That's what I was like with Penny. I wanted to tell everybody, I'm in love, man, and I'm enjoying every second of it. Don't you upset the burst my bubble. So that's what I'm, I'm praying over you young ones. I'm saying young ones, but, you know, in the Bible, if you're under 30, you're young, you know. But I'm praying for those of you who your marriage is going through difficulty. And you know what? I've experienced divorce. It's not wonderful. And I'm not talking about an affair. There was no affair. Contrary to what people have said, sometimes I wish George, I had had an affair with her, then I would have been able to accept the charge and go, yep, I sure did and fair enjoyed every second of it. But people still believe a lie and they want to believe whatever they want to believe. That's why accountability is important. That's why as God's given you a mother and a father as a pastor. So that when you're not thinking straight, you can go to them or their leadership and say, I need help. I need to know. So when I pray this prayer, no matter where you are, receive it. Now, Heavenly Father, I, I bring these, first of all, I bring these young people before you who maybe not have fallen in love yet, but love's just around the corner, just like that old song says, bang, crash, color gazam. All of a sudden, around the corner comes the woman of their dreams, and they can't think straight. Everything's just full of emotion and joy and love and passion, and that's the way you made us. I want them to enjoy that. But with the fruit of knowing that their fathers, their mothers, and those that they give their life to and honour have prayed over them and have given their blessing. Lord, I want them to experience what I have just experienced in 14 years later in life. I may be putting words in my wife's mouth. She reckons marrying me at 48 was like marrying a 40-year-old virgin. Well, you know what? That's how I felt. I felt like I was experiencing love for the very first time. I had preached a love revealed for 30 odd years but never experienced it so for those marriages that are in front of us right now husbands and wives who are holding each other's hands and they're going through a little bit of tough testing time right now the passion isn't there like it used to be and there's a longing and there's a desire for that to be there Holy Ghost you can, you can do that miracle you can restore passion where there was none. You can restore passion where it's been misplaced or lost. Our vows are very special and they mean so much to us. Yet there are some right now who are having to walk, in my opinion, through the dark valley of divorce. 
It doesn't matter what the reason is. That's a dark, lonely path. And many walk it by themselves. I don't know how they do that. I don't believe they ought to do that. That's why you sent your son Christ to die for us so that we wouldn't be alone. There'd be people around, family around who would just love us for who we are. Not even have an understanding. Lord, let let those men and women, whoever they are, whether they're in this building or around the world, I want them to know, first of all, I love them. I care. I know what it's like to be alone, to be cast off and cast aside, to be, have things spurred to about. I, I know that feeling. It's dreadful. But then I know the joy of having godly men and women put their arm around me and say, we love you, Ian. We believe in you. We still believe the gift is there and we still trust you. Well, that's what I'm praying now, Lord. I don't know all these people who are in any of those three categories, except they need to be reminded that our Heavenly Father doesn't condone anything, but he absolutely commends that I'm going to love you no matter what you've done. There's always a consequence to pay. I know that. I've had to pay it. There's a consequence for everything we do that's not according to your word. But never once have you said that you take your love and your support away. And we as a body of Christ, number one, ought to be the best lovers on earth. We ought to be the ones who forgive the quickest, who forgive the first. But in our marriages, we ought to be the best lovers. We ought to be showing our children how to look after their mother. We ought to be showing our daughters how to look after their father because it's what's seen in the home is what will be done so I pray this over them I pray your anointing upon them let them never ever be the same I pray this to you Yehovah in Yeshua's name for I ask this in Yeshua's precious name Amen Father, we pray over our president right now in the name of Jesus. You've sent someone here from Australia, an Australian who recognizes the gift that this nation has been given. And we pray over our president and thank you for filling his life with your wisdom. Let him be surrounded by godly counsel. Let him hear, Lord, your voice. And that he's, as he moves forward with this nation, I thank you that you will protect him that there is a protective covering upon him. The enemy will not touch him in Jesus' name. And with every decision that he's facing, Lord, I thank you that he is following you with all of his heart. He wants to do the right thing for this nation. We pray over his staff, his cabinet. We pray over the Congress. We pray over the Senate. And thank you, Father. We pray over the Supreme Court. And believe that there's an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that is taking place in Washington, D.C. It is alive with the awakening of God. And we honor you and glorify you that these are America's best days. America's best days. That there has been a new birth for America. And we are in it now. In the name of Jesus. Father, we pray over Ian and Penny as they return to Australia. And as he pursues the step of faith into the Senate. And thank you, Lord, that you are guiding him and directing him by your Holy Spirit. And that, Father, people will recognize the goodness of his heart. People will recognize how honest this man is. People will recognize, Father, how much he loves them. And the shepherd's heart, which was born in him, will continue to manifest itself in a greater degree. Lord, that's what I heard today. I heard the shepherd's heart in this place. And we need more like him in these positions of authority in our governments. And we receive them, Lord. And thank you for this precious time. In Jesus' name, everybody said, 
Amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise and glory for this. Thank you. Ian. You know, Terry, I appreciate you coming up because um, Terry, uh, George was sharing something yesterday. You know, I heard your dad say something many years ago. And yet I've been thinking to myself all the time here, geez, I hope it's right, because if I'm wrong, he'll tell me. Or he'll let me know that's not correct. But I think I heard your father first time, way in the late 70s, say there's only two times to say sorry, when it's your fault and when it's not. (laughs) And I thought about what you've had to do. You don't know everything, but I was thinking about that. And you know, part of qualifying to be a father you have to say sorry when it's your fault and you have to say sorry when it's not and God honors that both and just increases the door as he will do for both praise God, praise God. well we have somebody brought this to us Ian and uh, Pastor Greg and he said just this uh, the Lord hears and answers prayer and today this is the Israeli flag and the Texas flag <laughs> and so we officially welcome you as a uh, <laughs> citizen today <laughs> There you go. So the next time you come, we want to hear you sing. The stars at night are big and bright. Yes. Samuel sings it. Samuel can sing it. Well, that's our kind of guy. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Give him a hand. Isn't that wonderful? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, I, I did... Oh, there's, bless the Lord. They want yeah, to bless, want to bless Ian. Ian. Well, okay, you can do it. Let you can do it. Bless bless, let the people bless Ian. Listen, I want to ask you to forgive me, I if you will. I know after that message, you'll be glad to, right? I bypassed the announcements this morning. I got excited about my offering. I told you, it had been too long since I've been up here. But I bypassed the, off, the uh, announcements this morning, and I don't want you to walk away. I know the scripture says, let those that are ignorant be ignorant still. But I don't want you to leave today not knowing what's going on. So would you give me a few minutes and let us play the announcements right quick so that I won't be into And then Pastor has something to do. Let me me say that if anybody wants to bless Ian and Penny, just write, if you're writing a check, you make payable to EMIC and um, Usher's Weekend. If you can have baskets in the back, people can drop that out on the way out today. And uh, did you, was there something, EMIC guest for... Texting, text to give, 36609, 36609, yeah. 36, and then e- EMIC e- guest. Yes, right. All, yeah. all one word, no, no space. EMIC guest, and the amount can do that. Okay, so you can do da- that while... What? Question? $25,000. $25,000, okay. Okay. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, if you will, give me a few minutes here, just about three minutes of your time while you're doing that, and watch these announcements. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us for service today. We want to say a special welcome to all of our guests and ask you to fill out a welcome card, which can be found right under the seat in front of you. If you fill out that card, it gives us an opportunity to connect with you. You can drop that card in the offering later in service or bring it to our guest reception in the hospitality room where we want to bless you with a free gift. At that reception, you'll get a chance to meet some of our church staff and leaders and ask any questions you may have. Now let's take a look at what's happening here on the mountain. Hello, everybody. How are you? I am so excited about Southwest, and I know that you are too. Now, I want to invite you to our Summer on the Mountain service. This coming Wednesday, Pastors George and Terry are going to lead us in a time of prayer, preparing the atmosphere for what God really wants to do at Southwest this year. So you have got to be there. You've got to bring a friend and come ready to pray. Here's Mary to tell you more about prayer opportunities. Here at EMIC, we believe that when God's people pray together, the power of the Holy Spirit is released. So join us Monday through Friday from 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. in the living room for corporate prayer over the upcoming Southwest Believers Convention. Bring your supply and join your faith with ours as we believe for signs, wonders, miracles, and fabulous outpourings from heaven as a result of these meetings. We'll see you there. 
All right, everyone, we have an opportunity for you to serve and show love to our e-members who will join us for the Southwest Believers Convention. The Sundays before and after Southwest, July 30th and August 6th, we'll be shuttling e-members from downtown here to the property for a special reception. We'll need greeters, shuttle guides, luggage handlers, and people to welcome them to the reception. If you're interested in volunteering on either or both of these Sundays, please click on the e-member reception rotator on emic.org and fill out a short form. Thanks in advance for sowing your time and effort into making our extended family feel welcome right here on the mountain. Now, when you look the devil in the face and you say, I plead the blood of Jesus, he just heard the whole New Testament slammed in his faith with the force of the name. The Lord intends for us to be blessed and well and strong and whole. That the purpose of this meeting is to undo what the devil has done. He's not going to let you go under. This is the beginning of the best days of your life. Join us as we celebrate 50 years in ministry. Attendance is free. Register for the 2017 Southwest Believers Convention at kcm.org and step into the year of fabulous outpourings from heaven. For additional information on any of these events or to see what else is going on around the mountain, check out the city, follow any of our social media channels, or visit emic.org. All right, let's all stand up together as we prepare to dismiss today. Altar ministers, if you please come to the front. And yes. As they're coming, I want to uh, let you know that this Tuesday evening at Thrive, we have Jerry Ann Savelle will be speaking. So ladies, the Thrive, you can catch it online or join us here Tuesday evening. And then I believe there's a volunteer meeting today. Am I correct? A volunteer meeting in the living room. Somebody tell me if that's right. Dining room. Dining room. Sorry. Volunteer. Okay. Volunteers for Southwest and for for the two Sundays or just Southwest? For the two Sundays. I'll get it right. <laughs> so for the two Sundays. Yeah, listen, last time, what was our last bus count? 300, 300 visitors that have registered to ride buses from the convention center for the Sunday before convention and after oh. convention. So... I want you to, so that's just the ones we know we're coming. We need lots of help. And next Sunday, you know, you come in, it'd be great. We've got, um, where's our first overflow, Dwayne? The back room back here in the middle school room will be overflow. And so if some of you want to give up your seat Sunday and come make room for guests, that'll be great. So we'll start with that. But we're going to prefer others and watch the blessing of God be poured out. And it's our seed sown towards this Fort Worth convention. So if our altar ministers are here, if you have need for anything today, the things that Pastor Britza talked about this morning, you want someone to agree with you and pray with you, and especially ask our pastors to step up today to the altar. And if you need some of our pastors to be up here, if there's some counseling you need in that, please feel free to step forward or to contact us there online, and we'll be glad to reach back. Pastor Greg will tell you how to do that at the end of this today. God bless you today, and remember that as you go out, and you go out, that you're going out in the, the mission field, but remembering this, that God loves you, Pastor George and I love you, and what? Jesus, Jesus is, is Lord. Lord. Give praise to the Lord, everybody. Praise God. You are dismissed. What a wonderful day here at, it reminds me of the prodigal son, um, you know, when he's talking about our prayer to his father and his father restored him then to be the Pharisee Frankenstein brother that criticized everything. And I'm going to tell you something. Some of you today, but I'm going to tell you what I told a friend of mine here. River rocks are smooth because of friction. Come on now. All that water rolling over them and rocks bumping into rocks. And I tell you, I want to be a smooth stone. Amen. And sometimes things don't seem to, you know, you're like, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You heard the word today and you heard and saw demonstrated for you how that God heals and God restores and what seemed to be the lowest moment actually catapulted in into the very halls of his government and the member of parliament actually met the queen. 
what, what the devil means to destroy, God will lift you up. So I'm telling you is because of setbacks in your life, don't disqualify yourself because that's what it is. You'd be disqualifying yourself. Don't disqualify yourself. We want to hear from you. We want to hear Tim Mountain on the way to Southwest. Info at EMIC.org is how you share with us. Info at EMIC.org. I'll see that and our entire staff. We want to see you. Let me tell you what's coming up with our men's conference. And after that, I'll come back and pray for you and then we'll go on. Watch this. Men, listen up, because you won't want to miss this. Built to Last, Men's Conference at Eagle Mountain International Church, Friday and Saturday, September 29th and 30th. Including an amazing time of worship by Michael Howell, great food at the after party and Saturday morning breakfast, VIP meet and greet, and a powerful message from keynote speaker Mark Barclay. It's time to cash in our meow. Our wimpy little, I don't know, I'm going to make it or not. You know, meow, it's time to cash that in for the lion's roar. The roar of the lion of the tribe of Judah. It's called a war cry. Make plans now and invite your friends, your fathers, your brothers and sons to Built to Last 2017 Men's Conference here at EMIC. Friday and Saturday, September 29th and 30th. Register now at EMIC.org. So the end of September, be ready for the men's conference. And don't forget this coming Wednesday, we're going to be back here at 7 p.m. Central Time. We're going to be praying for the Southwest Believers Convention. It's going to be very special. And then I look forward to seeing you next Sunday morning right here at EMIC. Father, thank you for the word today. I thank you for what you've done in Ian's life. I thank you for what you're doing in every single one of our partners and our friends' lives around the world, from the top to the bottom, all the way around the middle. We call you blessed. Remember that God loves you, we love you, and Jesus is Lord. Jesse DePlantis, and guess what? You are watching the Believer's Voice of Victory Network.